final announcement for those of you that have entered the room and have not already done so, please uh, type in your full name, rename yourself, and your affiliation so we can accurately comment it. And I can identify you uh, to allow you to provide public comment. Uh, I believe we have everybody that's intended on the PNC committee to join us today, so welcome. Uh, we have nine members of the committee that have joined us. I've tried to designate that by renaming them. Uh, the quorum um, is met, so we're ready to roll. Uh, I think we have the rest of our staff here as well. Um, let me turn off the doorbell so I don't keep getting notified as people come in, but if my staff can help assist as people come into the waiting room uh, and continue to help rename them and allow them to enter, I'm just going to turn off this uh, doorbell in my ear. Okay. Um, with that, um, we'd like to get started. Uh, and so we'll start with our roll call and introductions. Up on the screen, we'll try to roll through uh, in order. Um, and then we'll bring up a staff list as well so we can introduce ourselves. Uh, for all the committee members, you should have the functionality to be able to unmute yourself. Uh, Tracy Klein was unable to join us today. Uh, so Karen, if we can lead off with you, and we'll also check your volume as we go through this list. Hello, it's Karen Michelson, uh, Pharmacy Director for the Copal Indian Tribe. And Fred. <laughs> Bill, you're next. Now I've got the unmuted. I'm Bill Oreger, I'm a family physician. I'm on the residency faculty of the Family Medicine Residency at uh, Samaritan Hospital in Quebec. Great. Welcome. You sound good. Jim, next to you, and Jim is our chair. Hi, everyone. Can you hear? Oh, great. Um, I'm Jim Slater. I'm vice president of pharmacy, and uh, I serve three CCOs, HealthShare, Columbia Pacific, and Jackson Care Connect. And Jim, we have a little bit of an echo, so I don't know if you have your computer on as well as your headset, but we'll monitor that as we go forward. Are you on and able to unmute yourself? Hi, I'm Mark Helm. I'm a pediatrician here in Salem, Oregon. Great. Sounds loud and clear. Thank you. But. Hi, I'm uh, Russ Huffman, and I'm a psychiatric uh, mental health nurse practitioner here in Salem. Great. Sounds loud and clear. Thank you. Jim Rickard. Hi. Jim Rickards, I'm a radiologist and uh, transitioning from working with the Eastern Oregon CCO to the M Health CCO as Chief Medical Officer. Great. Loud and clear. Thanks for joining. Kathy Zero. Yep. Kathy Zering, Pharmacy Manager at Salute Medical Center, Woodburn, Oregon. Great. Loud and clear. Patrick. Martino, a pediatrician and hematology oncology fellow at OHSU. Great, loud and clear. Thanks for joining. Uh, Dave wasn't able to join us. Uh, Stacy, do we have you as well? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Stacy Ramirez. I am a faculty at OSU and then a clinical pharmacist and the director of pharmacy for the community health centers at Benton Lynn County. Fantastic. And again, you all sound loud and clear. Just want to make sure you also can all see the screen, uh, the Zoom screen. If you are not able to, please let us know. And with that, we'll transition the slides to the uh, staff, and we'll go down from the top down. We'll start with you, Jennifer. Jennifer Bowen, Oregon Health Authority. Looks like your phone's unmuted, Jennifer. We can't hear you, so I don't know if you have your telephone. Or Can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Okay, Jennifer Bowen, Oregon Health Authority. Thank you. You bet. And again, this is Roger Citron with the Drug Use Research and Management Program, and I'm the program manager for our team. Trevor wasn't able to join us today, so we'll call you, Dave. All right, my name's Dave Engen, clinical pharmacist, OSU Durham team. This is Sarah Fletcher. I'm one of the PNC clinical coordinators for the Durham team. Uh, Andrew and Dean are not with us today, so Megan, to you. Hey, 
I think you might have to unmute her. I don't think she's a co-host. Well, that shows my favorite, doesn't it? <laughs> I draw my list. I can unmute her. All right, you're unmuted, Megan. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Megan Herring. I'm a faculty with the College of Pharmacy and a clinical pharmacist. And yes, Roger, I was unable to mute myself. Um, well, you're a co-host now, so you have the power. Thank you. This is uh, Rich Wolfsapple, I'm a pharmacy manager for DXC Technology. Hello, I'm Deanna Moretz. I am with the College of Pharmacy, and I uh, work with the Derm team. Hi, I'm Kathy Santana. I'm a clinical pharmacist with OSU as well. And my name is Sarah Fivid. I also work as PNT clinical coordinator with Sarah Fletcher for the Derm team. This is um, Dee Weston. I'm the pharmacy program policy advisor with OHA. And I'm Brandon Wells. I'm the pharmacy program analyst for Oregon Health Authority. For sure. Thanks, everyone. You all sound loud and clear. Uh, again, uh, if any committee or staff have any questions, you can uh, IM each other, send a chat to one of the best, and we can address that. So, with that, uh, conflict of interest is the next phase. Um, all members of the PNT, all staff that work for the OHA and the OHA themselves, fill out conflict of interest declarations. Um, those are asked to be updated whenever changes are made. Similar to the conflict of interest that we ask, we're all members providing public or written comments to the committee. So with that, um, we just have an opportunity if anybody needs to declare any um, conflicts that the OHA is not aware of. Hearing none, we'll go to the approval of the agenda and the minutes. Um, first of all, the minutes have been sent out to the committee in advance. They had an opportunity to review those. And in regards to the agenda, um, the agenda is straightforward. We're going to be moving through it in order, we anticipate. Uh, but this is an opportunity if any of the committee wants to take a topic off of the consent agenda and put it on to the open session to have a discussion. So with that, we'll see if there's any changes to the agenda. And then if not, uh, a motion to approve the minutes or give us any amendments that you've identified. And I have to apologize. Um, what is listed on the screen here is this uh, last um, ag consent agenda from the last meeting. Um, so let me see if I can pull up the correct consent. Working with that effort. Um, so, 
we realize that all of you are also um, pulled away to do uh, COVID-19 response and um, making time for this as well, the PNC will really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for um, helping us con with um, continue that work.
Perfect timing.
wanted to remind the committee that this is a DUR focused meeting. The PUC committee serves as our DUR board. Uh, the, it's federally mandated that P or a DUR board meets quarterly, so we focus one of our meetings each quarter on um, providing our DUR reports. Uh, so with that, um, we will turn it over to Rich Holsapple uh, and our prospective DUR report. If you're following along in the packet that's posted online, uh, not able to see what's on the screen, that starts on page 99 in the posted packet. Thank you. Hello. Um, just a real quick uh, overview of ProDUR activities for second quarter 2020. Um, here is uh, just the, the highlighted overview of all the uh, different ProDUR alerts and the volumes that we had. Um, early refill pregnancy are highlighted because those are the two that actually will deny claims. Um, we did said, saw higher early refills uh, for second quarter, mostly due to COVID-related um, uh, just allowing patients to get their meds filled early. Um, not quite as high as first quarter, um, but definitely still um, higher than normal. Uh, you can go to the next page. Um, so this is the um, high level of some of the, the top drugs that really refill. Um, nothing really uh, out of the ordinary to note here. Um, so you can go to the last page. Um, and this is um, looking at the early refills uh, by, uh, oh, I didn't update the names of the months. It is, it is, it is uh, actually April, May, and June. I updated everything except the names of the months in there. So, um, but you can see the reasons for the early refill overrides. Um, you can see that uh, CC13, uh, emergency disaster, which is when we, usually never see. Um, we did still have 12% of our overrides due to that. Um, that's just basically what they pharmacies will use if it's COVID-related early refill. Um, other than that, um, most of them were just medically necessary change in dose uh, type of situations. And that is all I have. Thanks, Rich. Any questions for Rich on the prospective report? All right, in addition, we do retrospective DUR. Uh, that's up on the screen. If you're following along in the packet, it starts on page 102, and we'll turn it over to Dave Engen. All right. Thank you, Roger. Um, so as you were made aware, uh, many of these initiatives that were temporarily suspended due to the COVID emergency, but now we're getting back into the flow, so you'll start to see those numbers increasing again. Um, I also want to remind you that we're reporting third quarter numbers, even though uh, we're currently in the fourth quarter. So pay attention to, to that column. So the fourth, the full fourth uh, quarter numbers will be shared in the December meeting. Uh, on the first few pages, uh, you'll see the change form and those optimization initiatives, uh, but those were basically turned off for third quarter. So um, on page 103, though, you'll see our uh, dose optimization numbers back up a little bit and um, you know as we message our uh, prescribers about consolidating consolidating their patients medication to a more reasonable cost effective quantity so uh, you know two five milligram tabs uh, to one ten milligram tab that type of type of thing so uh, page 104 uh, you'll see our uh, expert consultation referrals uh, that goes to Opal K to ensure safe prescribing for children on multiple antipsychotics. Um, although you know, relatively few rise the level of needing, needing you know, natural referral, uh, it is warranted at times. So, um, but we're currently reviewing the effectiveness of the program and uh, we'll, we may bring you something to review at the end of the year. So keep your eyes and ears out for that. Um, on page 105, you'll see the numbers for uh, patient non-adherence notifications that we send to prescribers uh, regarding patients not filling their antipsychotics uh, to help avoid interruptions in therapy. Um, on page 106, you'll see the various profile reviews. Uh, we rolled out a prescriber notification initiative uh, with high-risk patients on opioid therapy and sent out uh, customized letters uh, whenever appropriate. Uh, we'll see if we get some more traction on that over the next few quarters. Uh, the 
interesting respiratory controller made after a claims denial. Uh, things like uh, pediatric patients that were denied a TCA claim um, due to age restriction, but there was no follow-up PA requested. So we get out uh, the notifications for those um, as far as uh, safety and uh, you can see the numbers associated uh, with that. Get some more traction on that. And, and we're constantly evaluating the initiatives that we have and new opportunities as well. So uh, you as a committee, we hope to continue to get your input uh, for any suggestions and feedback. So any questions, Beth? I just wanted to know TCAs, um, there's a, not very many of them, but uh, are those getting prescribed for any research or something? Is that the reason why they're not getting any sort of follow-up prescriptions? Um, I don't have the reasoning for that. I would have to pull uh, individual, um, the individual profiles again. Um, these are, some of these are, uh, when they're identified, um, notification that is, uh, is sent out. So um, I can pull those in and report back to you, uh, get a little more information for you as far as what exactly they're being uh, prescribed for. It's not necessary to do any extra work. I was just curious. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a low number of patients who are prescribed those medications. So, um, yeah. But, you know, there are some concerns in terms of use of this. So. Right. That's a good question. Hi, it's Jim. Um, I think I'll also insert at this part of the agenda, we think about retrodur, but we also think about produr and benefit setup. Um, it, it might be a good idea, and I'm interested in the other committee members' input here, but uh, if, we, if we imagine in our next P&T meeting, we may be in a place where there's more COVID-19 than there is today, um, and it may be that we finally in Oregon experience a greater surge than we've all experienced to date, and, uh, and maybe not. But nevertheless, um, I'm wondering as a committee and as a support team, if we all should like think towards the October P&T and, and A, summarize for the committee uh, what's been done when COVID first arrived or is still being done to accommodate COVID for our, 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 our populace or in the fee-for-service space, uh, B, uh, are there things that could be added as choices that could be used if things got really difficult? And then C, um, maybe it's time for a fresh communication to providers and pharmacies to remind them what's at their disposal. If there's need for COVID, even though they've used elements of it already, um, maybe some don't have the volume to remember what's, what's available to them. So it's just this idea together as a committee um, and staff to think about pro, being proactive for COVID preparation for a more significant surge and are there any practical steps we could take before we need them to be ready as opposed to responding to it as it happens, which is just fine in the state. And we have a lot of capabilities at our disposal. So this is not a fear-based um, request or a concern, it's just I just feel like as a committee, we should call the question, can we be more formal in our agenda for October to kind of do a pulse check on where are we and where, where might we want to go to get ready? Yeah, we can try to prep that again at the last meeting. Um, at your request, I went over some of the steps the OHA has taken in light of COVID. Uh, just briefly, we reminded pharmacies that they could do an early refill uh, and use override codes. We encourage them to fill maintenance supplies and medications. So for those drugs, they could get three month supplies. We turned off edits so we didn't stop drugs simply because they were non preferred. And we identified existing prior authorizations and extended those um, for a period of time. If they were year long prescriptions, we extended them for a longer period. If they were short courses, we gave them an extra month or two just so the patients uh, weren't left with a provider that might not be in their office and pursue a PA. But we can try to bring those steps back in October and remind you what we've done and see if there's other ideas the committee might have to prepare the OHA with your blessing as we move forward. So good idea, and we'll try to set something up for October. Great. appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions for Dave? Or? 
If not, one additional piece of uh, drug use review is education. And one of the ways that we do that is through our newsletters. Uh, I hope everybody has signed up to receive those great newsletters. But if you're following the packet, we're on page 108, and we'll turn it over to Kathy Centena. Thanks, Roger. So today we'll be referencing two newsletters that were published in March and April. Biosimilar Medications, Key Considerations for Providers was published in March, which was a helpful overview of the role of biosimilars in patient management. And the second newsletter, Coronavirus Management, Evidence for Treatment and Drug Shortages, was published in April with timely considerations for the evolving pandemic. Uh, we continue to send a newsletter draft to the committee for feedback, and I really appreciate your help in this regard. Our next newsletter is scheduled for publication in August, and it's uh, targeted immune therapies for rheumatoid arthritis, so that'll probably be later this month. And then at this time, I'd like to solicit the committee for newsletter topics that may be of interest to our providers um, going forward. COVID-19 testing could be a good one, maybe. Great, thank you. Kathy, building on that, there was a CCO pharmacy director's meeting earlier today, and there was a nice presentation on that topic, so I think that kind of spurred you along to think that might be a good topic. So we'll try to get those slides and maybe collaborate with the people that put those together because it could be a, a real worthwhile topic. Great. Thanks, Roger. Yes, I just want to call out that was Providence, and they did a wonderful job. Okay. Any other questions for Kathy? Again, if for the audience, if you haven't done so, please sign up on our listserv so you receive notification when we publish these and any ideas, uh, shoot them into us so that we can consider those for future newsletters. So thanks, Kathy. Uh, moving over to the preferred drug list, a new business on our agenda, uh, reference to page 116 uh, in the agenda packet. And Kathy, we're going to leave it with you. Great. Thanks, Roger. So today I'll be talking about uh, the newer diabetes drugs and cardiovascular outcomes. Um, going to the next slide, the reason for this update was to include new evidence comprised in the 2020 Drug Effectiveness Review Project Report on newer diabetes drugs. So this includes the classes uh, DTP4 inhibitors, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, additionally, there was one randomized control, control trial that was also included. Uh, so the DERP report did serve as a main evidence for this review, and all studies in this report included patients with type 2 diabetes, and in, most of the patients included, included in the studies were also at high risk for cardiovascular disease or, star, or had established cardiovascular disease. So when we look at the policy for coverage and utilizations, um, like I mentioned, three classes fall under this review. The first one are the GLPRAs which um, we do allow for use of Bidurian and Victoza without prior authorization if prescribed in conjunction with or record of prior metformin use. Um, however, all other GPRAs or GLPRAs um, must go through the, the outline PA criteria. Uh, the second class is DPC4 inhibitors. They do require a PA with the requirement of a trial metformin and a sulfonylurea or contraindications to these drugs. Um, and then the DPP and DPP, DPP 4 inhibitor citagliptin is preferred, but also does require that patients meet specific clinical PA criteria. And then lastly, the SGLT2 inhibitors are available as a last line option um, meeting clinical PA criteria. For utilization, uh, prescriber alignment with the preferred agents is 41% for the GLP-1s and 81% for the DP, DPP-4 class. Um, but as mentioned before, there's no preferred products currently in the SGLT-2s, but the majority of the utilization was with empagliflozin. And um, overall, the newer di diabetes drugs do account for a substantial expense to the OHP each quarter. So looking at the next slide, I apologize, it's kind of a busy slide, but these were the drugs that were included in the DERP report, uh, a single entity agents as well as combination therapy. And just as kind of a general review, um, metformin is preference first line with our trusted sources and all major guidelines. A second line therapy, there's no um, agent that's universally recommended after metformin. 
However, uh, Caddis and NICE, they all recommend uh, um, options of these newer diabetic agents uh, with similar HbA1c lowering as well as adverse effect profiles. I thought it also might be helpful in light of the topic of this report, which is cardiovascular outcomes, to update you on indications associated um, with, with these cardiovascular outcomes. So um, we do have four drugs that have the indication for reduced risk of major cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. And that includes canagliflozin, liraglutide, doliglutide, and semaglutide. Uh, and pagliflozin have, also has an indication to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, as well as reducing the risk of hospitalizations due to heart failure in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease or multiple cardiovascular risk factors. Um, the as we'll talk about a little bit more later, the pagliflozin also is indicated to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in adults with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction regardless of diabetes or um, diabetes status, so with or without diabetes. And then lastly, canagliflozin is indicated to reduce the risk of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, cardiovascular death, and hospitalizations for heart failure in patients with diabetes or with diabetic nephropathy with alveolaria. And just as a reminder, there are black box warnings for these classes. Um, most of the GLP-1 have a black box warning for thyroid C cell tumors, and then um, there is a black box warning for lower limb amputation with canagliflozin. So now that we kind of updated ourselves on the, the world of diabetes here, we'll go to the specific evidence, the next slide, um, that was provided in this report. So when we first looked at the GLP-1s, um, it was found with moderate strength of evidence that exenatide, extended release, liraglutide, and semaglutide demonstrated a risk reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, approximately 1 to 1.4% with a number needed to treat of 71 to 100 in patients with type 2 diabetes based on moderate evidence. And these were studies lasting from about two to four years. Uh, there was a neutral effect on the risk of hospitalization for heart failure in comparison between GLP-1, RAs, and placebo. When looking to the DPB-4 inhibitors, uh, most of the evidence for cardiovascular outcomes was neutral based on low to moderate quality of evidence. There was, however, a low risk of or an increased risk of hospitalizations uh, for heart failure based on low quality of evidence for saxagliflozin, which was a uh, number needed to treat of 143. Moving on to the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, they were found to significantly reduce the risk of hospitalization due to heart failure. Specifically, canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and pagliflozin were all reported to have a reduced risk of hospitalization due to heart failure uh, in studies lasting about 2.6 to 3.1 years, with the number needed to treat of 42 to 80. Additionally, as mentioned before, with the indication of um, pagliflozin also was noted to re reduce all-cause mortality uh, compared to placebo, 5.7% compared to 8.3%, number needed to treat of 38. Canagliflozin was associated with a reduced risk of hemorrhagic stroke in patients with pre-existing fibrovascular disease with a um, hazard ratio of 0.43. And then lastly, the randomized clinical trial that I referenced earlier was the dipagliflozin trial that some patients with and without type 2 diabetes in a history of heart failure, um, dipagliflozin was found to uh, reduce the composite outcome of worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death, 16.3% versus 21.2%, um, making that about a number needed to treat of 20 for benefit over a medium, median of 18 months. So the recommendation for this class um, were to, um, that, that for the newer diabetic therapies is to take the three different classes and make them second line treatment options, uh, removing the requirement for step therapy other than metformin. So currently there's at least a requirement of sulfonylurea um, and then with some classes additional agents as well. So if we look specifically 
and how that would affect the PA criteria. That's actually on page 125 in your packet if you want to follow along there. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, we can see here the changes starting with number four, including that depagliflozin is the indication for patients with or without diabetes uh, for heart failure. So asking if the patient does have a diagnosis of heart failure with reduced injection fraction, and they're requesting depagliflozin 10 milligrams there in number five, then go ahead and to improve that use. And then number six is where the recommendation to remove the sulfonylurea trial um, comes into play. And then, um, and then lastly, just uh, making sure that patients meet the um, GFR rates as recommended in the prescribing information. So uh, is, uh, if anyone has any questions on, on this specific criteria, I can address it now, or I can go over the other criteria, and then we can always come back to it. So feel free to weigh in if you'd like. Um, but moving on to the GLPs, again, um, pretty straightforward. The only change would be to just remove that sulfonylurea trial and just require metformin in, for the non-preferred agent. And then lastly, going to the next slide for the DPP-4s, um, same change there in number three as well. So this time um, I can answer any questions or we can go to public comment, um, for whatever, Roger, you prefer. We do have a couple people signed up for public comment. Again, any questions for Kathy on the clinical presentation or proposed changes to the PA criteria? Pat here. Um, I just noticed on page 126, there's maybe a discrepancy or it might just be a misunderstanding with the approval duration or like line five, the 12 month approval versus uh, from like line seven, looking at a six month approval. Hey, Pat, that was page 126 in the big packet. Yep, looking at the uh, SGLT2 Duration. Okay. Thanks. There might be uh, intention behind that. I just noticed it was kind of a, between line five versus seven. Yeah, you know, originally we had um, approved these up for six months because of the associated adverse reactions um, with these agents as they were newer. That's definitely something we can uh, bring up for discussion. Um, but you're right, in number five, for heart failure, for that indication, it was recommended that they be approved up to 12 months. So I I would not oppose to having that extended to 12 months in number seven. That would add consistency. Is anybody opposed to it being 12 months? Great, thanks for bringing that to attention, Matt. Any other questions or um, Comments on the proposed criteria? This is Karen, and I was just wondering when we talk about um, in step six when patients have failed metformin, I was just wondering if we should include that they failed a therapeutic dose of metformin. Because oftentimes patients don't get titrated to therapeutic doses, so I just think that might be something to include. I'd also add my usual comment about medication adherence. Um, most people fail medicines by failing to take them. It may be useful to have a look back at the um, medication fail history that might inform some providers about what's going on with the patient. Do I'd like to make some comments on the general studies here. Uh, first of all, Kathy, this is a superb um, summary, and I'm going to steal your slides from my teaching because this sums it up very nicely. Thank you. Overall, the cardiovascular effects of these drugs, I think, is, is unknown. The results are all over the place. And there's nothing consistent, um, and so you can pick any, any drug at any endpoint and get whatever you want. 
the only thing that's consistent is the SELT2 inhibitors and prevention of hospitalization for uh, congestive failure. But I'd like to make some comments on that. First of all, um, I've done hospital concurrent utilization review for 13 years now, so I review cases for medical necessity and insurance payment. And I've done, I stopped counting about five years ago when I did 10,000 cases. There's a huge variability in who gets admitted to the hospital for congestive heart failure. And it has very little to do with the severity of the illness. Most of all, it is usually social factors. It can be something as mundane as how busy the ER is. And it certainly is very much dependent on the skills of the caretaker for the patient. Because many patients who are very ill, but a skilled caretaker can be managed an outpatient. All of these studies are multinational, done over a wide variety of countries. They used to publish which countries and how many patients, but that has vanished from some of the more recent studies because the, the countries vary from um, Western Europe to Eastern Europe to South America and all over Asia. And the variability in congestive heart failure admissions uh, over the European countries is huge. The European Union publishes these things, and the rate of hospitalization as admissions per thousand population varies about fourfold from around one in some of the Scandinavian countries to over four in Germany, and the U.S. is about in the middle of that. So. I'm not sure that preventing a heart failure admission in one country is comparable to another. So the data is what it is, but I'm very skeptical that this is something that you can, that really proves anything. You know, dead is dead whether you're in Slovenia or Corvallis, but admission to, hus to a hospital for heart failure depends on a whole bunch of things, even within the same hospital system. Now, I don't know what we do with that, and I, I didn't object to the criteria because I can't really find a way to, to do this, but, but I'm just very skeptical that this data does what it says it's supposed to do. And we do need a lot of alternatives for diabetes because it's a difficult disease and we need the options, but these drugs are mediocre as far as A1C.
I think I've done the hand wringing for everybody for this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> well, maybe our public commenters will make you have something else to wring your hands over. So, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Wheeler from Eli Lilly. I uh, signed up to provide public comment a couple times today, but on this case, uh, in relation to the lag with time. Uh, so with that, I've unmuted your line, and Anthony, can you hear us okay? Yep, I sure can. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. All right, fantastic. Uh, well, thanks, Roger. Hopefully I won't inspire too much more hand-wringing. Uh, I'm Anthony Wheeler. I am an employee of Eli Lilly and Company, which manufactures Trulicity. This is also known as Dula Glutide. It's part of the GLP-1 receptor agonist class of drugs. Uh, this drug is a subcutaneous injection. It's dosed once a week, and it's delivered using a single-dose pen device that has a hidden uh, pre-attached needle, and there's no mixing or reconstitution necessary to use it. Uh, I know you've reviewed this drug uh, several times before, and you got a nice update of research uh, earlier. I just wanted to provide a couple updates uh, that were recently finished and didn't make it into uh, your report. The first is the completion of the Rewind study. This was a large-scale cardiovascular outcomes trial, uh, similar in design to the other studies that were mentioned uh, for other GLP-1s. In this case, Trilicity showed superiority to placebo in terms of a three-point composite major adverse cardiac events. Uh, these data inform a new indication for Trilicity, which is to reduce cardiovascular events in adults with type 2 diabetes who have either established cardiovascular disease or multiple cardiovascular risk factors. This indication was added to the prescribing information earlier this year. Uh, the other update is the continuation of a real-world evidence study we previously conducted and I shared with you when we had six months of data. We've now extended the study to include a year of data. And this showed patients initiating Trulicity had significantly higher adherence and lower discontinuation than those initiating uh, by Durian or Victoza. So thanks, as always, for letting me provide a few comments, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you have.
doubling of serum creatinine and renal or cardiovascular death by 30%. The impact of credence is transformational to clinical practice. Investigators estimated that if 1,000 patients were treated for two and a half years, only 22 patients would need treatment with Invicana to prevent end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, or renal or cardiac death. In addition, among the same number of patients, Invicana treatment would prevent 22 hospitalizations for heart failure and 25 composite maze events. Regarding safety, rates of overall adverse events were similar with canagliflozin and placebo, except for diabetic ketoacidosis and male genital mycotic infection. I'm pleased to report there was no imbalance in rates of fracture or amputation. The overall safety profile was otherwise consistent with known adverse effects associated with Invicana. In 2019, the ADA had issued an update highlighting the efficacy and safety endpoints of credence. The update elevates the recommendation of SGLT2 inhibitors over GLP-1 in type 2 diabetes patients with chronic kidney disease and states that renal effects should be considered when selecting antihyperglycemic agents. Given that Invicana is the only type 2 diabetes medication that has demonstrated significant renal and cardiovascular benefit in patients with diabetic kidney disease and type 2 diabetes, we ask the committee to add Invicana to the PDL and make it available for Oregon Medicaid patients. And thank you, Dr. Santana, for your review. Thank you. Thank you, May. Any questions for May? Okay. Kathy, I'm going to turn it back over to you to uh, recap the recommendations in front of the committee. Okay, thank you, Roger. So the recommendation changes that have been proposed are to um, remove the requirement for sulfonylurea use from all of the different um, newer diabetic classes. So that would be the DPP-4 inhibitors, GLPRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and just requiring that metformin step within the criteria. I know there was suggestions to verify adherence as well as dose of metformin, so I'm not sure if we want to move forward with that um, and talk about that further or if what the, how the committee feels on about that. Sometimes I, this is Kathy, I, sometimes I think it's we wait too long, you know, before we go to the next step and then it's like, year and a half or two years before the patient can on optimal therapy. So that's one of, one of my hesitations about, you know, adding those those criteria to the PA. Right. I'm going to second that. Um, and I think that lots of times, you know, I understand about trying to get to a therapeutic dose of metformin, but, you know, there are lots of patients out there who simply can't tolerate that. And if we um, delay getting them effective therapy, then we put them at risk for further complications. So I'm going to second Kathy's comment on that. And and for not adding um, any additional path through or any additional steps to move on to a secondary treatment. And it's Jim, I would suggest this is a topic I think that is, is, is important and has come up, you know, several times, right? Thanks to Mark. And, and I think it's you know, there, there's a pathway here to consider this type of an approach, but I don't know yet whether prior authorization is the way to do it. And so I would suggest that if we can think of a retro dur approach that would verify how bad uh, it is of an issue, even though we know it does happen, right? Um, or that if we decide to move forward with this type of an approach for prior authorization, then I think we need to revisit and think about a lot of different PA criteria to be fair and consistent. So I think it's a relatively bigger ask when you think about it, right? Um, and I think if we want, if the committee feels strongly that we should dig into this, we should frame it in a way that we can and not do it criteria by criteria would be my recommendation. Yeah, Jim, I don't have any objection to that. And I, you know, I think that, that, that when it comes to some of the medications in terms of um, adherence to, to them, some medications are more important than others. Um, adherence to metformin, if you can tolerate it, um, is really important. Uh, adherence to some other medications may not be so much. Um, but, but I do agree that looking at it on a, on a, on a more global level is probably helpful. Yeah, and I would say I think there'll be other reasons um, that can be can be added to this curiosity at some juncture when 
it seems important to look at adherence and see what's getting in the way versus what's working and where might be the adherence um, therapeutic categories that need attention. You know, that's more of a quality, safety, retroder type of thing when we're ready to tackle that, and maybe that's where this type of consideration can be thought through. Yeah, I think it also gets to some health disparities and social determinants kinds of issues as well. Right, right. This, this is Bill, and I'm kind of in favor of some kind of requirement for a good trial of metformin. You know, when you compare metformin to all the other drugs, it's been around a long time, so we've got a lot of data, and it has huge benefits that are very clearly proven. We know its toxicity, and we know how to manage its toxicity, and there are warnings for renal failure that should be standard. Uh, and we also know that there's a high degree of intolerance. But then we take this huge step, and it's also four bucks a month. So then we take a step to the next drug, which costs 100 times more, or 200 times more, with very preliminary data that may or may not work out in the long long term. You know, there's some drugs where going from the first step to second step is an incremental change. This it is a huge order of magnitude in both evidence and cost. So I think there needs to be some kind of bump there, but not so big that the people that people can't get over it if they if they and their physician decide that they truly can't tolerate it. And I, and I think simply asking and asking the judgment of the prescriber <coughs> is sufficient. So, okay, let me think about this. So if I'm hearing you right, Bill, then what you're really saying is even though the provider has clearly asked for the next therapeutic agent because they and their team are the ones submitting for it, that we also want them to basically a test that the metformin dose has been maximized to the appropriate level or something to that effect before moving on? Well, I, I'm not sure how to do this because right. that, what is maximal, and that becomes an administrative nightmare. Right. I am, I am comfortable with the criteria as they are written. Okay. Um, because that's about the only way to practically do it. And yes, there'll be huge variation in who requests it and how hard they try. We're stuck with that, but we have to err on the side of getting the next step to the patient, despite okay. the cost. So I, I'm okay with this, and I'm just kind of throwing out some caution that, um, and, and your, your analysis that this is in a state of flux and we will have a much better idea on this in five years is, is absolutely true. And so we just keep re reviewing it. You know, if we see, can I suggest to the committee that if we see collectively with the staff helping us watch that the use of a met metformin and the maintenance of metformin as, as initial therapy starts to move into a whole different direction where we see a lot less metformin um, maintained use, you know what I mean, something that's markedly different, maybe that's a juncture where we look into and make sure metformin is being adequately explored and used. You know what I mean? Like I almost feel like we need another trigger here to orient digging deeper. I mean, it's only up to you guys because you're all committee members, but I'm, that's just my guess. Uh, the these, these drugs that we're adding on a second line are also have side effects, so it's not like, you know, metformin has terrible side effects and with something better. I mean, they're going to probably get some side effects with these other agents, too. Uh, and this is a disease state that probably the pharmacology you know, while some of it's really quite good, is not really going to fix the whole disease state. There's a lot of other factors that go into type 2 diabetes and management. Diet and lifestyle, chief among them. Right. Uh, my thinking, uh, I mean, if we wanted to add um, something to the metformin, I mean, there is a typical, I mean, we could, we could check to see whether or not they've had a prescription for 500 milligrams twice a day or, or you know, 1,000 milligrams of extended release or whatever. Um, but as a practitioner, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, Jim said earlier, like the practitioner has, you know, is the person who's requesting this. So 
uh, presumably they have some clinical judgment that says that the, you know that um, that this is the next reasonable step, and uh, I uh, you know I feel like um, throwing up too many barriers. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not a huge fan, especially in, in diseases like like diabetes, where we um, where they, they end up costing the the health system so much money. I feel like um, you know putting up additional barriers may not be long term in our best interest. But I also think it'd be interesting uh, to follow up on utilization and cost, and you know, see what happens with metformin prescriptions, and see what happens with you know, these more expensive, um, new, these second-line agents, and maybe I'll change my mind. And, you know, Jim, I was thinking about, you know, what, what, what you, you were talking about, you know, how we as a committee might be able to look at this, but really the awareness needs to happen at the level of the individual prescribers. So if you're treating a large number of type 2 diabetes patients, then the question is, well, how, how closely aligned are your individual practice uh, practices, I guess, with the medications and then also how much or, or to what degree are the patients who you're treating actually fill the prescriptions that you're prescribing. Uh, you know, I, I'm always a fan of, you know, the idea of a report card to let prescribers know what's going on with their individual practice. Uh, and that's a complicated task, but this might actually be a, a medication category uh, that would be really useful for that sort of information. Yeah, I can just offer really quick, Mark. Um, you know, Care Oregon worked with OHSU, and we did an extensive um, effort to educate our providers in order to meet quality metrics on best practice and how to think through diabetes and create, you know, a simplified pathways to treat and then provide them data on where their patients were and their own prescribing patterns and had, you know, experts come in and educate them about other ways to approach uh, the diabetes and care for it. And it, and out of that journey, what was quite clear is I think, to, to, at least to our experience, the providers were quite familiar with metformin and quite comfortable in using it with a, with a few exceptions. You know, there was the congestive heart failure concern and where, how does that really play out sometimes in the decision making. But but nevertheless, for the most part, that wasn't the barrier. The barrier was what to do next when metformin failed and when to get to insulin versus when to try these other agents. That's where the, the, the discernment and the education seemed to need to occur, not this initial step or this initial step being used to its fullest. Now, I can't speak to all Oregon providers or perhaps providers that service the people service population that we're not familiar with, but I can just tell you that was our experience of going way deep into the space. So I'm hearing good points, uh, but to try to focus this on a recommendation for the UHA, um, I think there's an opportunity for us, and so I'm taking a note that we can consider a policy evaluation to see uh, metformin use and provider practice patterns after we've changed these PA criteria as we move forward. Um, so that's something we can look at in the future and monitor. But for the recommendations in front of you, it would be to recommend the removal of the requirement for step therapy other than metformin for these three PA criteria. Uh, as edited, so the question number seven changed to 12 months in the SGLT2 inhibitors. Does that capture the recommendation accurately, Kathy? Yes, that's what I had, Roger. Thank you. Good. Any other proposed changes or amendments to what's in front of you other than the question seven in the GSGLT2? And if not, then we just need a motion. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion approved. Great. Thank you. And again, I think great recommendations for us to try to look at those patterns and see if we can learn from those, maybe do some education or some outreach. So um, appreciate that. Next, we'll move on to page 131 in the broader packet. It's up on the screen. Uh, we'll turn it over to Megan Herring for the non fat drugs for dyslipidemia. Okay, great. Thank you. Can, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. As I said, I'd put myself on mute. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the um, other dyslipidemia drug class, the non-statins. 
This class was reviewed about a year ago in May 2019. So the purpose of this class update is just to evaluate any new evidence for the um, effectiveness and safety of these medications on cardiovascular outcomes and to evaluate the data supporting the efficacy and safety of a new um, drug appro approval, bampadoric acid, and determine its um, appropriate place in therapy. Um, so this is just um, a little bit of a reminder on the data that we do have um, for these drugs in this class on cardiovascular outcomes. So to date, um, we have four medications that have demonstrated um, a modest impact on the composite cardiovascular outcomes. So the P two PCSK9 inhibitors, evolocumab and alirocumab, um, azetamide in the Improve It trial, and the most recent trial, um, icosapent ethyl, which is an omega-3 fatty acid in the Reduce It trial demonstrated um, an increase in cardiovascular outcomes. Next slide. So looking for any new um, evidence in this class, um, there were two systematic reviews that were identified, um, but nothing that really um, gave us new high quality comparative evidence that would change our current um, management strategies that we have in place that evaluated or compared medications on cardiovascular mortality or cardiovascular events. Next slide. Um, there were two new FDA um, or expanded FDA label approvals um, since the last time we looked at this class. So alirocumab was FDA approved to reduce the risk of MI stroke and unstable angina in adults with cardiovascular disease. This approval was based on the ODC outcomes trial, which was which was in the um, slide a couple of slides ago, and we did all the, already evaluate this um, data in a previous review. And then the second one was. In December, the FDA expanded the label of icosapent ethyl as adjunct to statin therapy to reduce the risk of MI stroke coronary vascularization and unstable angina in adults with triglyceride levels um, greater than or equal to 150. And again, this was based on the Reduce It trial, also data that we reviewed in a previous um, at a previous meeting. Next slide. So the um, new drug approval, um, benzodoric acid, um, or nexlithol, and then benzodoric acid in combination with azetamide, nexlithet, were FDA approved. Um, benzodoric acid is a prodrug that's metabolized in the liver to an active adenosine triphosphate citrate um, lysate inhibitor. Um, this is basically an enzyme that acts upstream to the HMG coenzyme A. Um, and so this medication also inhibits cholesterol synthesis in the liver, similar to statins. And it is approved um, as adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy. The treatment of adults with heterozygous familial hypercholesteremia or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease to require additional lowering of um, LDL. And so these were the three um, main trials for approval of these two drugs. Um, so benzodoric acid was approved based on two pivotal secondary prevention trials in um, patients with um, established ASCVD or heterozygous familial hypercholesteremia on maximally tolerated statin therapy. This was the Clear Harmony and the Clear Wisdom trial. Both were 52-week randomized double-blind trials that compared benzodoic acid to placebo patients on baseline therapy with an LDL of 70 or greater. Study design um, inclusion exclusion criteria was similar. Um, in, however, in clear wisdom, there was an additional four-week run-in period for statin optimization and compliance that was included. Um, the majority of patients in both trials had ASCVD, about 95%, and, and less than 5% had um, heterozygous familial hypercholesteremia. And then the trial by Valentine et al. in the right column on this table um, was the trial that compared benzodiazepine acid in combination with azetamide. This was approved based on one 12-week randomized controlled trial that compared the combination to each individual drug and active placebo in patients with ASCVD, um, familial hypercholesteremia, or high-risk cardiovascular patients on maximally tolerated statin therapy. 
Um, about 60% of patients had ASCVD or FH, and 40% were primary prevention patients with cardiovascular risk factors. Next slide. So the primary outcome in all these trials was change in LDL from baseline at week, at week 12. So both of the trials, the benzoic acid resulted in a significant reduction in LDL from baseline um, compared to placebo. So it lowered LDL about 20%. Um, this was consistent across subgroups, including baseline cardiovascular risk, baseline LDL, and baseline with the lower therapy. Um, the so this magnitude of LDL lowering is similar to observations of acetamide when added on statin therapy and lower than what is seen from the TCSK9 inhibitors when added on to statin therapy, which can lower LDL um, between 40 and 60 percent. And then the study that looked at benzodiazepine acid with acetamide also resulted in a statistically significant reduction in LDL with the combination compared to the individual drugs and placebo demonstrate that both agents contribute to the drug's um, treatment effect, and that it might appear to contribute more to the treatment effect than um, benzodiazepine acid. Next slide. Um, trial limitations. Both, or the, both trials or all trials have significant exclusion criteria and a high percentage of patients that fail the screening or um, run-in periods about between 34 to 60 percent in the trials. Um, so there is concern for generalizability of these results. Um, again, none of these trials were designed or powered to evaluate the effects on cardiovascular outcomes. They were all um, funded by Esperion Therapeutics. Um, the population in the benzodiazepine acid is that our trial may not adequately reflect intended clinical population because there were low rates of adequate um, baseline with the lowering treatment. And there were high rates of um, treatment discontinuation in the studies. In terms of safety in the pivotal benzodiazepine acid trials, there were significantly more discontinuations due to adverse events um, in the treatment group compared to the placebo at about 10.9 percent versus 7.5 percent. The incidence of muscle-related adverse events was similar in the two groups. The most common reasons for discontinuation were diarrhea, musculoskeletal pain, elevated liver enzymes, um, and headache. And then some other um, safety concerns, more patients on benzoic acid experience gout, um, increases in serum uric acid, tendon rupture, and new onset VPH um, in men compared to placebo. Next slide. So recommendations are due to its unknown benefits on cardiovascular outcomes to maintain benzoic acid and benzoic acid is NMI that's not preferred and include prior authorization to limit utilization to high-risk cardiovascular patients, requiring additional LDL lowering, um, as well as to update the prior authorization for eclosis and ethyl to include the new FDA-approved indication, and then evaluate um, comparative costs of this class in executive session. Um, so changes to current PA, tr PA criteria, um, this is the omega-3 fatty acid PA criteria, which I believe is on a hunt page 154 of your packet. Um, and so we basically added in, this is the new indication that comes from the FDA label for icosid and alcohol. So um, I didn't include number six, sorry, but number six asks if the drug is icosid and ethyl, and then it's yes. Um, we just ask that the patient has established cardiovascular disease um, or type 2 diabetes with two or more cardiovascular risk factors, which is the new um, indication, and then that the patient has triglycerides greater than or equal to 150 while on maximally tolerated statin treatment. And Megan, this is Kathy. So how about we have this new criteria and the patient's already been on it. What happens with the renewal criteria? Um, good question. So we don't currently have renewal criteria for this class. Um, so if they're already on it, they want to hit this again for another year, right, Roger? Right. I think, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. a year. So I'm just, we're just thinking ahead of what happens then. 
Yeah, I mean, we could look in executive session to see how much utilization we've had of this, if that's a concern or not. Well, it wouldn't be that they wouldn't hit in a year. I think it already requires a PA, so if their PA as a non preferred agent ran out the day after the PA criteria goes into production, they hit the criteria. So if they were already on this, then they would get, and they didn't have... Right, it's currently a non-preferred agent, so that requires a PA, which would be loaded for a year, but that PA has a variable end date, and so it's not going to necessarily be associated with dedicated criteria. Okay, and this really just increases the, the, the population that would be approved based on this PA, because previously it was only approved for patients that had triglycerides greater than 500. Right, so those that were currently on therapy, we don't know when they would have had that PA loaded necessarily. We could go out and uh, find out how many there are and load PAs to be associated with us on the same date, uh, or we could put in renewal criteria. If I remember correctly, this is Deanna, we had really low utilization of both of these, and like Megan said, we'll be talking about it in the exact session, but the last time we presented it, we only had three or four people, and the recommendation at that point was to retire the PA criteria because we had such low utilization, but we decided not to do that. And this is Sarah, for those patients that are initially approved under this new approval criteria, once that initial PA runs out, uh, because there's no renewal criteria, they'll be asked the same questions again, and I assume if they've met it once, they'll still meet it a second time. Okay. Or do we want to look for some evidence that it's actually made a difference in terms of uh, cholesterol, LDLC reduction? Correct. Yeah, I don't, Pat here, I don't know the threshold with which we typically employ that approach, but um, just looking at like one of the studies, the supplement, like the percentage of patients that had um, a really trivial response, like less than a 5% change, uh, it's pretty significant. They didn't actually report a percentage, but if you just eyeball the figure in the supplement, it looks like a lot of patients um, either have an increase in LDL or zero change. Yeah, and that would seem to be, if they have an increase or zero change, seem to be not a great choice. For the icosamine alcohol. I was speaking in reference to the uh, benzoic acid. Uh, but again, if the utilization is really low, like, I don't feel strongly that there would need to be a renewal criteria. I'm just... Okay, that's fine. or some other anti-inflammatory properties that seem to be helpful? Um, good question. I don't remember seeing that in the in the, the pivotal clinical trials that I looked at. The one that's in the New England Journal had a significant change in CRP, like 24% at 12, 12 weeks and then still about 20% at 52 weeks. I just had a quick 
quick update. Uh, my name is Carrie Johnson, and I'm a pharmacist with Amgen Medical Affairs, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide the committee with an update on Repapa. Um, Repapa is a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds to PCS uh, SK9, and you can see the full prescribing information for indication, safety, and dosing. Uh, Repapa is administered subcutaneously via pre-filled syringe, pre-filled circlic auto-injector, or push chronic system, an on-body infuser with a pre-filled cartridge. I have no requirement dose titration. Um, I wanted to provide an update to the committee and just make you aware um, that the results of the Repatha five-year open-label extension analysis that included data from five phase two studies was just fully published, um, showing that uh, there were persistent median reductions in LDLC from baseline of approximately 56% observed with Repatha over con the continuous period of five years. No new safety signals or increases in adverse events were observed over the five-year period. The rate of discontinuation due to adverse events was 1.4% per year, and there were no reports of neutralizing antibodies. The second thing I wanted to uh, make the committee aware, there were just some considerations now when looking at the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology 2018 cholesterol clinical practice guideline in light of this additional um, long-term data with Repatha. So those guidelines recognize the cumulative evidence supporting association between lower LDLC levels and reduced CD risk, including the results of the Repatha Fourier trial, and recommended several populations considered appropriate for PCSK9 therapy. So although the guidelines recommend addition of azetamide as first-line non-statin agent in very high-risk ASCBD population, there have been analyses published since the development of these guidelines that are relevant to consider. And the first thing in consideration is um, following the guidelines, the price of Repatha has been reduced to improve affordability. Um, and a corresponding value assessment found that Repatha met accepted cost-effectiveness thresholds at the reduced price. That's the first consideration. The second was that the guidelines have highlighted that long-term safety and efficacy data support the use of azetamide. Um, and then... Uh, just as previously described, the long-term analysis of Repatha now, a five-year open-label extension analysis um, that I just described, um, is now available. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide updates and considerations regarding Repatha, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Terry. Any questions for Terry? Okay. With that, Megan, turn it back over to you just to recap the recommendations in front of the committee. Yes, so the recommendations are to um, make maintain benzoic acid as not preferred and to include prior authorization criteria to basically limit it to the same way we limit the PCSK9 inhibitor, so based on the guideline to only high-risk ASCVD patients on maximally tolerated statin therapy and azetamide who still have LDL um, greater than 70. Um, and then also update the prior, the prior authorization criteria of icosis and ethyl to include the new FDA um, indication. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Great. Thank you. All right, we'll continue uh, turning to the full pack at page 160. The slides are up on your screen, and we'll turn it over to Deanna for the MS uh, DERP summary. All right. Um, so the update on this, like you said, Roger, starts on page 160. Uh, just a little bit of background. The last time we reviewed the uh, disease-modifying drugs for multiple sclerosis was actually in 2017 uh, when we discussed ocrelizumab 
which at that time was a relatively new biologic that had been approved to treat primary progressive MS, and that still remains the only drug that has the FDA approval to treat primary progressive MS. Um, at that point in time, we also created a separate PA criteria for natalizumab or tocibri, which was separate from the biologic medications. And then at that uh, P&T meeting, we also revised the PA criteria for the oral MS drugs to remove the requirement to try and fail uh, the interferons or the teramir, uh before approval. And if you remember, uh, back in June, uh, Sarah presented uh, revised MS uh, PA criteria for the oral medications because um, several oral medications had recently received approval for relapse uh, for relapsing MS, which encompasses clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting disease, and active secondary progressive disease. And at that point in time, we also removed the PA criteria for map because that was recalled from the uh, U.S. market due to safety concerns. If you're interested, the PDL status for the MS drugs is presented in Appendix 1 on uh, page 177. And uh, just in short, the preferred MS drugs on the PDL are Plateramir, Acetate, Interferon Beta 1A, and Interferon Beta 1B. Uh, the non-preferred agents basically include all the oral medications and then the intravenous uh, monoclonal antibodies. During the first quarter of 2020, uh, we only had about 10 patients, 10 fee-for-service fee -for patients that had claims processed for MS drugs, and most of those were for the non-preferred, the two non-preferred oral drugs, uh, dimethylfumarate and fingolimod. And then we had about 30% utilization of interferon. So the purpose today is to uh, review the comparative evidence um, of the disease-modifying drugs um, that's been published since 2017 based on uh, the results from a drug effectiveness uh, review project, systematic review. So um, I do want to note in the uh, packet, it says there was three new oral CMDs that the DERP reviewed. Actually, it was four. So they reviewed uh, cladaridine, uh, diroxamal, fumarate, ozanamod, siponamod. Uh, those four drugs are reviewed. And then there's a fifth uh, new oral agent as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Sarah. So I just wanted to kind of review real quickly um, how uh, we have quite a few drugs that are used to manage uh, multiple sclerosis. So uh, we'll start with uh, the injectable disease modifying drugs. Uh, most um, people will start with an interferon or glutaramir. Um, they might go to peg interferon. Um, all of the drugs on this uh, chart, which is extracted from table one on page 162, all of these medications are administered via the subcutaneous route except for Avonex, which is given IM. And the dosing varies uh, either from a daily injection up to every two weeks for the PEG interferon. Um, you can see that all three drugs are um, approved for relapsing MS, which is the three uh, clinical courses that have been identified, the clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting MS, and, and secondary progressive MS. Um, next slide, please. So these are the oral medications that we have on the market that are used to manage uh, MS. Um, the first three drugs are uh, Sgonavid uh, uh, 1 phosphate receptor inhibitors. Um, then we have uh, teraflumide, and then uh, the next three drugs are all uh, uh, fumarate salts. So dimethyl fumarate, monomethyl fumarate, and uh, diroxamyl fumarate. And then finally we have uh, uh, clodarabine. Now you see most of the oral drugs are approved for all three uh, phases of relapsing. Clodarabine has some safety concerns, so it does not have the approval 
for clinically isolated syndrome. So it's only approved for relapsing, remitting, or secondary progressive. And it's also recommended to not uh, use clitheramine first line to try other agents. Uh, and if people have had an inadequate response or they can't tolerate those alternatives, then clitheramine might be an option to move towards. The next slide, uh, these are basically um, the drugs that are administered by the IV route, so they have to be infused. Three of these four drugs are monoclonal antibodies. The first one, uh, minazantrone, you may recall that's also used as a chemotherapeutic agent, and I have the wrong um, brand name there. It's not Pethibri, it's Novantrone. Um, and then you can see some, there's some variability with these drugs in terms of what they're approved for. So minazantrone and uh, elantuzumab are only approved for uh, relapsing, remitting, or secondary progressive MS. Uh, Cisagri can use, be, be used for all relapsing forms. And then um, here's ocrelizumab, which um, has the approval for all relapsing forms of MS as well as primary progressive. Primary progressive uh, MS does not occur as frequently as the other forms. It only occurs about 10 to 15 percent, and generally patients are older when they get diagnosed with primary progressive MS. I want to point out that uh, the first three drugs on this chart all have black box warnings with regard to uh, toxicity and safety. Um, if you look at that chart that's in the uh, class update, uh, pretty much all of the medications, with the exception of the interferons, have some long-term uh, safety issues associated with them. I also want to point out that um, some providers will use rituximab to treat uh, primary progressive MS. It's been studied, but uh, its use is limited due to uh, poor efficacy and serious adverse effects, so it does not have FDA approval to manage uh, MS. Next slide. So I'm going to just summarize uh, the DERP findings. Um, I hope you've all at least perused the, the update. Uh, I thought the Drug Effectiveness Review uh, Group did a nice job summarizing all the evidence. So what they found um, essentially is uh, this was the fourth time they've done uh, an update on MS since they originally published it in 2007. Um, their update included 14 new uh, randomized control trials, and overall the summary includes 42 randomized clinical trials and 30 observational trials. Most of the trials uh, that they included were assessed as being fair or poor quality using the GRADE methodology. So um, when they looked at the DMDs and looked at head-to-head -head trials, the four that really uh, rose to the top as being um, effective at reducing relapses were uh, elantuzumab, singolimod, ocrelizumab, and teraflutamide. Um, they showed also that for relapsing MS, clodarabine and saponamod are more effective than placebo, although, as I mentioned earlier, clodarabine does have some safety concerns. Uh, it has a block box warning with respect to malignancies and teratogenicity. And then um, for clinical uh, the CAS syndrome, uh, so there being clotiramir and the interferons and teraflumide reduced uh, conversion to uh, the other relapsing forms of MS uh, compared to placebo, and they didn't seem to be associated with more serious events. Next slide, please. When the DERP authors looked for uh, eligible randomized control trials, they could not find any for um, uh, diroxamel. Uh, the FDA approval for that drug was based on bioavailability studies that compared dimethyl fumarate uh, delayed release capsules uh, to uh, diro uh, diroxamel fumarate, and then there was two placebo control trials. Uh, and since the FDA approval, there's one ongoing study and one published randomized clinical study that evaluated the safety and efficacy, but they did not meet this, the uh, drug effectiveness 
Research Review Project inclusion criteria for the report. Compared to the other disease-modifying drugs, the risk of infection was lower with the interferon beta and glutaramir acetate. And overall, the risk of specific adverse events was higher uh, with some DMDs compared to others. So, for example, the risk of liver injury was higher with uh, alentuzumab, teraflutamide, and fingolimod. And then the risk of uh, PML, which is progressive multifocal uh, focal, uh, leukoencephalopathy, it was higher with fingolimide and dimethylfumarate compared to the interferons, uh, and that was uh, cited from an observational cohort study. I will remind you that the monoclonal antibodies, uh, ocrelizumab and uh, natalilizumab, they have black box warnings for the risk of PML, as does uh, alentuzumab. So those were the summary findings from DERP. Uh, next slide, please. So there was some safety alerts. Uh, alentuzumab now carries a warning about the risk of stroke. Um, it, it was added to the boxed warning, uh, which is uh, the FDA's most prominent warning, based on uh, 13 cases that were reported shortly after people started uh, taking the medication. And then um, fingolamide now carries uh, a warning that when the drug is stopped, that uh, people may notice they have severely increased disability and maybe uh, new lesions on the MRI um, after they stop therapy. So that warning uh, was added to the FDA label. Next slide. So there is an additional oral uh, agent, uh, another fumarate salt. Uh, that received, it initially received tentative FDA approval in November of 2018 for treatment of all the relapsing forms of MS. Um, it is another bioequivalent alternative to dimethyl fumarate. <clears throat> and the uh, FDA issued final approval for mono. Uh, methyl fumarate in April 2020 as Biogen's patent for dimethyl fumarate expired in June of 2020. The FDA based approval of monomethyl fumarate on clinical trials that demonstrated the safety and efficacy of dimethyl fumarate because it's considered a bioequivalent alternative, uh, monomethyl fumarate is, to dimethyl fumarate. And then um, I think we had some testimony in June uh, that Jelenia or Fingolimod uh, now has an expanded indication um, as of August 2019 for use in patients that are aged uh, 10 years and older. Next slide, please. Okay, so the PA changes are outlined on page 178 of the packet. Uh, if you want to look at those, because it's a little bit easier to see the changes um, in the packet, but uh, the recommendations are to revise the oral MS therapy PA criteria uh, to include all five of the newly approved oral disease-modifying drugs, and then to add uh, the safety monitoring metrics that Sarah presented um, last p and meeting, and then we added renewal cre uh, criteria. Uh, there's no changes to the preferred uh, drug list uh, based on safety or efficacy data, and we'll evaluate costs in executive session. Next slide, please. So to go through the specific changes, uh, the first change uh, was to add all the oral drugs, um, and they're classified uh, according to their mechanism. So the Sphonagase 1 phosphate receptor modulators, singolamod, lozanamod, and uh, cetonamod, and then the three fumarate salts. And then we also have uh, teraflutamide and cladarabine. So um, the first change was to uh, make sure that it was for an FDA-approved indication and it was in the appropriate age range. So uh, Sarah had added uh, a new table um, that we reviewed at our last P&T meeting uh, to highlight that. And then if you'll go to the next slide, uh, question uh, six was revised. Uh, to see if this was continued therapy, and if it was, uh, if it is continued therapy, we added renewal criteria. And then question seven, um, it's not read here, but it is in the packet, um, talks about some of the safety concerns 
we always had the CT concerns highlighted in written format, but uh, Sarah had created a new table um, that she presented at the last P&T meeting. Um, next slide, please. And then if you go to question 11, that was revised just to be a, gen a generic description of um, the class for fingolamide, lozanamod, and saponamod. And then question 17, 18, uh, 19, and 20, um, it stops right there at 17, but the rest of the questions were added uh, to assess if it was for uh, use of cladarabine, and the safety questions are being asked because of the risk of teratogenicity and malignancy that are associated uh, with use of that agent. Next slide, please. So this is just the table that highlights the FDA indications. And then this final uh, slide um, summarizes the safety, the baseline safety assessments that should be uh, conducted before therapy is started. So um, any questions about the DERP summary or the PA changes? So we left the renewal criteria the same. That's why there's like nothing after it. I was kind of confused. Yes, there was no change to the renewal criteria. Yeah, that's a good question, Kathy. <laughs> Any other questions for Dana? All right, we do have one person signed up for public comment, uh, Linda Finch with Biogen. Linda, can you hear me? And can we hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? Can hear you loud and clear. Okay, excellent. So um, my name is Linda Finch. I'm a medical value liaison for Biogen, and I support a portfolio of MS therapies, so Tecfidera, Vumerity, Avonex, Plegrity, and Tysabri. And today I'm going to give you an update on Tysabri. So the Tysabri USPI was updated June 17, 2020, to include new safety and risk information and updates to the warnings and precautions section. So specifically, the PML risk table has been updated uh, based on a larger number of patients, now we have 100,000 patients in the U.S. that this data is based on um, compared to 69,000 that the previous label was based on. Um, and it also now includes risk stratification data out to eight years, which was previously based on six years of data. Um, so one of the specific um, highlights here is that the PML risk for JCV negative patients has been updated um, to be Originally, it was less than 1 in 1,000 um, on the previous label. It is now listed as um, 1 in 10,000, so a significant change there. And then the risk for JCV-positive patients developing PML, both those who have had prior immunosuppressant use and those that have not, has also been updated to reflect this new larger data set, um, leading to reductions in risk estimate, estimates for JCV-positive patients in all categories. Um, we have also added that there's a risk of thrombocytopenia um, that has been observed in post-marketing setting. So Oregon's current PA criteria require that MS patients try and fail two drugs indicated for the treatment of MS before using Tysabri. And these criteria do not really take into account the heterogeneity of MS and that some patients have highly aggressive disease, often early in their disease course. The CMSC guidelines support the use of Tysabri for initial therapy for patients with early aggressive disease characterized by frequent relapses with incomplete recovery and the accumulation of focal lesions on MRI. The AAN guidelines also recommend Tysabri or another high-efficacy DMT for people with highly active MS. So given the recent revisions to the label with a reduction of risk of PML for JCB-negative patients as well as JCB-positive patients, I respectfully request that Tysabri be allowed for first-line use in JCV-negative patients and for earlier use in JCV-positive patients that present with aggressive or highly active disease. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to call your attention to the new indication information for Tysabri that was updated last year that includes all forms of relapsing MS in your PA criteria, still specifies that the patient has a diagnosis of relapsing remitting MS, so I'd ask that that PA be updated to reflect the label indication, which encompasses all relapsing forms of MS. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to address any questions. Any questions for Linda? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right, turn it back over to you.
you, Deanna, if you can recap um, the recommendations and take it over to the committee. Okay. So um, the recommendations are to revise the oral MS therapy to uh, include the newly approved um, uh, oral disease-modifying drugs, um, and then to add the safety monitoring metrics and renewal criteria, um, and then no changes uh, to the PDL were suggested, and we'll evaluate costs in executive session. Um, I think we should revise the Tasagri um, PA criteria to include relapsing forms of MS, not just uh, RRMS. That's a great point. But I don't know if the, con uh, the committee wants to talk about um, making it first line. Um, it's, a it's approved for um, CIS, RRMS, and um, uh, secondary uh, progressive MS. So we could just revise the uh, RMR to say that it's for relapsing MS. Not here. I would agree with that. Okay, so uh, did we have a motion? Okay. And I'll make a motion to approve. And a second? Second. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Quick process check. Is the committee okay with doing one more class before we go to a break? Or does anybody need to take a break right now? Keep going. All right, let's keep going. Uh, if you're following on the full agenda packet, we're turning over to page 190. Uh, there's bringing those up on the screen, and we'll turn it back over to Kathy Santetta. Great, thanks Roger. So I'll be talking about serotonin agonists. This used to be the tryptan class, but with a new agent that has been approved, we modified it. Then we modified the name of the class to serotonin agonists. Uh, this short class update um, is going to um, update the information since the last review, which was in May of 2019, and to evaluate the new evidence uh, for the new drug, which is called aditin, and um, its name is lesmitatan. So in addition to this update, I'll be providing a, a new drug evaluation on lesmitatan, which is an oral therapy approved for acute migraine that works as a 5-HT1F agonist um, without the vasoconstrictive properties associated with tryptan. A current utilization is um, <clears throat> over 90% adherence to preferred therapy for all routes of administration because there are oral, nasal, and subcutaneous tryptans available. Um, overall, this class does not re represent a substantial cost to the OHP, and prior authorization is required for therapies that exceed quantity limits. And just as a general reminder, uh, the acute treatment of migraine is usually with acetaminophen or NSAID for mild to moderate migraines, and then tryptan for moderate to severe migraines um, that work on the 1B, 1D receptors. Um, and this is substantiated and uh, validated with our trusted sources. Um, and they also have been shown, the tryptans have also been shown to have similar adverse effect, uh, um, adverse effect profiles as well. So moving on to our new evidence, the pertinent guidelines available for this review um, are ones that outline treatment for children and adolescents um, from the American Academy of Neurology and American Headache Society. And they found that there was moderate evidence of pain relief at two hours, which is a very common primary endpoint for the acute treatment of migraine, uh, with oral ibuprofen and sumatriptan nasal spray, um, which was more effective than placebo. Non-prescription oral analgesics, such as I just referred to um, as NSAIDs or acetaminophen, um, are recommended first line for acute migraine, migraine treatment in children and adolescents. Adolescents with acute migraine symptoms were also found to have freedom from pain at one and two hours with zolmatriptan nasal spray and semitriptan naproxen combination tablets with moderate to high quality evidence. Additionally, there's moderate quality of evidence that zolmatriptan nasal spray is more effective than placebo for relief of photophobia at 30 minutes. That summarizes the guidelines. So moving on to new indications and safety warnings. Um, there is a new sumatriptan nasal spray 
called Tesimra that was approved in 2019 that works again on the hht one b one d receptors um, and is approved for acute treatment of migraine with or without aura in adult patients. A uh, single dose of sumatriptan 10 milligram nasal spray is recommended with a maximal dose of 30 milligrams in a 24 hour period. And this formulation was approved based on a bioavailability equivalent study, um, which used sumatriptan 4 milligrams. There are no new safety warnings for this class. So moving on, I'd like to discuss the new drug lisinitan, brand name Rayval. This is a 5-HT1F receptor agonist. As I um, already mentioned, it's referred to as a Dighton, and it's void of the vasoconstriction properties um, that are that negate the need for a cardiovascular warning associated with tryptin products that work on that 1B, uh, 1D receptor. Uh, the approved indication for this drug is for uh, use in adults who have acute migraine symptoms with or without aura. And if we go to the next slide, thank you. It was approved based on two different trials, and these had the same methodology um, and study design. So they, they, this is Spartan, but the um, Samurai as well were both phase three double-blind multi-center placebo-controlled randomized controlled trials. That was a single treatment trial, so the study was designed to treat one migraine over the eight-week time frame. In this trial, they did use three different um, those three different strengths of lisinitan, 200 milligrams, 150 milligrams orally as needed for a moderate to severe intensity migraine. And approximately uh, 3,000 adults were included in this trial with a Midas disability index of at least 11. And um, just as a reminder, the Midas scoring system assesses assesses disability from a migraine. And in this trial specifically, the average score was about 32 indicating a severe migraine or severe disability. Um, again, the study lasted eight weeks and the primary outcome in both the studies was headache pain um, freedom at two hours. If we go on to the next slide, the results of the trial. All three doses were statistically significantly better than placebo for headache pain-free at two hours with an absolute risk reduction of seven to 18 percent, number needed to treat six to four, excuse me, six to 14. Um, this study did primarily apply to patients with one or more cardiac risk factors with the average number of patients with a history of cardiac events they included was actually low, so only about six percent and highest in the placebo group, which was 7.1%. I apologize um, for that. And only 1% had an ischemic heart, um, form of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, use in this population is still unknown. And most of the patients, as I mentioned, did have severe migraine. So moving on to the next study, the Samurai study, we see again um, similar study design, but they did just use uh, lisinitin 200 milligrams and 100 milligrams compared to placebo. Uh, the average MIDAS disability index for this trial was 31, so again, um, patients with uh, severe disability from their migraine. Uh, the primary endpoint was the same in this study with headache pain freedom at two hours and this um, again with a single treatment study over an eight-week time frame. Uh, the, <clears throat> the results for this trial also found that the 200 as well as the 100 milligram with Vinatan was more um, effective than placebo with a number needed to treat of six to eight and an absolute risk reduction compared to placebo of 13 to 17%. So some of the trial limitations, um, these were both fair quality trials. Spartan uh, had an overall low risk of bias, but again, most patients did have severe migraine scores at baseline, and they had risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but those with actual history of cardiac, cardiac events was low. And in Samurai, um, similarly, it also was a fair quality study with unfair risk of bias, however, and a lack of details of blinding and data analysis. Um, again, patients with known coronary artery disease, uncontrolled hypertension, or clinically significant arrhythmia were actually excluded from the use um, in this population, so uh, the effects um, are unknown. 
Uh, there is insufficient evidence for the efficacy of lismidinam as rescue therapy or for reoccurring migraine. It's not shown to be effective with multiple doses, so it's used as a signal dose in 24-hour period. There is insufficient comparative evidence between lismidinam and other acute migraine treatments. Um, and in general, tryptan products have been reported as having results in pain freedom at two hours in approximately 50% of patients, which would suggest higher efficacy compared to lismidinam. And again, um, there's insufficient evidence for the effect of lismidinam on quality of life, disability, and loss of work with chronic use. And this is a drug that would be used chronically as migraine is a chronic um, condition usually. So um, that is just of note. So looking at clinical safety on the next slide, we can see again from these single dose studies that it was fairly well tolerated. However, um, there was a higher incidence of dizzy, dizziness that was noted um, within the lisbeditan groups compared to placebo. There were, um, moving on to the next slide, there were um, not a significant difference in severe adverse effects. And again, only small numbers of patients with known cardiovascular disease were enrolled in the trials, and therefore the cardiovascular risk in this population is still unknown, as well as there's insufficient head-to-head -head comparative evidence between lisbonidam and other acute treatments for migraine. Um, it, does have to, it does appear to have a similar safety pro profile, although it does have a DEA Schedule 5 um, uh, assignment due to the fact of euphoria and hallucinations associated with treatment. And there's also a warning that patients not drive up to eight hours or within eight hours of taking less medicine due to that, the dizziness and um, CNS effects. Moving on to the recommendations. After clinical review, there's no recommended changes to the serotonin agonist class of PDO. It, there is a uh, recommendation to modify the PA criteria to include osmenitan and evaluate cost in executive sessions. So we can quickly look at the PA criteria. Um, as you can see, we've updated the name on this slide. And moving to the next slide, um, the table in its entirety is on page 206. In your handout, I just included the update of lesmedicin with maximum quantity limit of eight tablets, which uh, corresponds to the prescribing information. And then um, number one through four is just standard wording um, from the criteria with no changes. If we look at the next slide. Um, and this is a verbal addition to what was in your packet, but we decided to add specific um, requirements for lesmedidam. And so you can see there in number six, it asks if the request is for lesmedidam. And then it um, directs uh, providers to number nine and just asks that the patient has tried two Tryptan products in order to receive, you know, or have contraindications to Tryptan uh, before receiving um, lesmedidam. on slide six and slide number seven. Do we want to change the nomenclature to the new, um, instead of saying tryptan there, to a serotonin agonist? Um, no, well, I don't, you know, I know. I, I, um, the initial thought was to leave that as two different tryptans because this was written this way for patients to be able to to try if they were um, trying to different tryptan or converting okay. to another. Does that make sense? So I that's a great okay yeah that was a great point. I considered that as well, and then I thought I thought that it still applied there. But thank you for that. And then my other thought is regarding the table that we have with the quantity limits um, per month. Uh -huh. um, I, I mean, this is just like an, uh, to see if we have patients in these groups that are overusing their medication or who should be on preventative therapy. This is something we want to look at, you know, in the next quarter or something, if that's possible. I feel like we have some uh, prophylactic therapy recommendations in terms of the PA renewal criteria, no? I don't know, I don't see that. But yeah, so this this is um, this class doesn't have a renewal criteria, and it does not have um, requirement for pre 
preventative therapy for any of these kids could we just use for acute treatment um it's my addressing your question i'm sorry if i didn't hear you correctly well i'm just you know i'm just thinking that maybe some, there's some patients in this group that are getting medications that probably need you know, preventative therapy and we're just not catching it you know that, that's a great point we can look um we can look at that data and get back to you on how many patients have requested additional quantities and don't have any preventative therapy on board. That's something we could look into. I think that might be a good thing for some retro here. Um, yeah. Because yeah. if they're getting it every month, I mean, there may be a group of people doing that, but we don't know. Yeah, that's a great point. I think there probably are groups that do that. Other questions for Kathy? They, they may request it, but we rarely ever approve it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but Rich, you wouldn't stop someone from filling on a monthly basis as long as they didn't exceed the quantity limits, correct? That's correct. Our audits are set up to allow the quantity limit every 30 days. All right, but if somebody was getting a full quantity limit and they were refilling their medication every 30 days, that's probably somebody who should be on a prophylactic treatment. I would agree. Okay, we do have public comment. There are no more questions for Kathy. Uh, we do have Anthony Wheeler. Anthony, try to unmute. Your line. Um, can you hear me now? Yep, it looks like uh, I'm unmuted. Can folks hear me okay? Very good. All right, very good. Thanks. Uh, well, I am uh, Anthony Wheeler again. I am an employee of Eli Lilly and Company, which manufactures plasmiditan. It's marketed as Rayvow. Uh, it is its own unique mechanism of action, which targets the serotonin. 5-HT1F receptor, which is a little bit different than how the uh, tryptans work. It's indicated for the acute treatment of migraine with or without aura in adults. Uh, I think you received a good overview of the clinical trial program, so I won't uh, repeat that, but I do want to just clarify uh, that Rayvow is really for patients who have tried a tryptan and did not do well with it. It's not um, being advocated as a complete replacement uh, for triptans or for a first-line therapy to try ahead of triptans. And it seems like your uh, PA criteria reflects that well. Uh, the efficacy of lasmeditan does not appear to be affected by prior triptan use or concomitant preventive use, as long as we saw the, uh, the clinical trials. The recommended dose is 50, 100, or 200 milligrams. It's taken uh, orally as needed, and no more than one dose should be taken in 24 hours. Um, also, as you mentioned, it is a controlled substance. Uh, it's Schedule 5, and this was the result of some drug liking studies that we conducted because uh, Rebao is a central nervous system penetrant. And lastly, there is a driving restriction that's in the label uh, that I wanted to mention. This is uh, to not drive or operate machinery for eight hours after taking uh, Rebao, and that was because of the dizziness uh, adverse event that you saw in the clinical trials and some subsequent uh, driving impairment studies that we conducted. So, uh, as always, see the, the package insert for all of the safety details, and uh, thanks for letting me provide a few comments. I'm happy to try to answer any questions if you have them. Questions for Anthony? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Kathy, turn it back over to you to recap the recommendations. Sure, Roger. So, yeah, the recommendations are just to update the PA criteria to include lismeditan, and um, which uh, sounded like most people were in agreement with. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Fantastic. Well, let's take a quick break. Uh, it is 3.15. Uh, how much time do we need? Five minutes may not be enough. I think, I think we've earned 10.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to get going again at 325. Thank you very much. All right, 325. We still have a bit to get through, and hopefully we don't have to um, stop ourselves from being able to go into executive session. Um, planning to try to get there before the 4 o'clock, so 350 is scheduled. We'll see if we can pick up a little bit of pace on the next three topics. Um, also, for the PNC committee, um, we still have to figure out how to zoom into executive session so we can share confidential pricing with you. Uh, so I just sent you all an email. Uh, it has a conference line for you to dial in um, to a separate phone line, and it also has the confidential pricing that will self-destruct after our meeting. Actually not, but you'll be asked to delete it. Um, but, yeah, pricing that we can't disclose to the public that we will review. So, uh, unfortunately, it has to come through as a secure email. I know there's issues, so as we're going through the presenting, if you can try to see if you can navigate getting in there and opening those up to see the conference line um, or and the pricing, that would be great. If not, you can uh, send a, a message to me or to um, one of the other staff, and we'll see what we can do to try to get that information to you. So. With that, uh, if you're following... After, did you send the uh, pricing info to the staff? I did, Deanna. Okay, I just sent it to my email. Okay. I just, yep. <laughs> and so I appreciate you checking for that. Make sure it came through on your end as well, and you can have any of the notes. Okay, I'll let you know. You bet. Thank you. Um, so if you're following along on the posted packet that's on our website, we're turning over to page 210. Uh, otherwise, follow along here on the Zoom screen, and we'll turn it back over to Kathy Fentes. Great, uh, thanks, Roger. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the CCRP antagonist. Um, this class was last reviewed in May of 2019, and the purpose today is just to update with new, um, new evidence that was provided in a recently published DERP report, as well as two new drugs that have come to market for the acute treatment of migraine, um, Rhyme Japan and Ubro Japan. Uh, the current policy is that um, all of these therapies do require PA and that currently there's no preferred option. And utilization-wise, in quarter one of 2020, there were 33 claims for these treatments, and they all do uh, represent a significant cost to the OHP. So turning to the next slide, it kind of out, it outlines the six uh, different CGRP inhibitors currently on the market. The first four are for pre preventative therapy, as you can see there, um, for patients with migraine. Um, noting, too, that galcanazumab is also approved for cluster headache prevention. And then the bottom two is approved for acute migraine treatment. I think it's also important to point out the dose and round of administration because it does differ slightly between the different agents. So you can see there, eptivanazumab is given IV every three months, erinumab, sub-Q every month, fermanazumab, uh, sub-Q every three months, and then uh, galcanazumab, sub-Q monthly. And then the acute treatment op options are given orally. As far as prophylaxis and migraine prevention, um, it is recommended for patients with greater than two headaches per week or for those with severe prolonged heart to treat migraines. Um, current recommendations do uh, recommend Divalproex, sodium valproate, topiramate, and beta blockers as first-line therapy with level A evidence as well as botulism toxin. Uh, traditional migraine treatments for preventative therapy usually show about a 50% reduction um, in headaches per month. As far as acute migraine treatment goes, we've already discussed this a little bit, uh, but one thing I did want to add is that overall uh, currently available tryptan therapy result in about um, one in five patients uh, gaining pain freedom at two hours from uh, tryptan therapy for acute migraines compared to about one in ten patients of the newly approved CGRP inhibitors. So moving, oh, and then cluster headache too, uh, key treatment for that is tryptans as well, and then agents such as valproate, or excuse me, um, rapamil or lithium can also be used as preventative therapy. So moving on to the next slide, let's focus on what's in the current DERP report, and I have divided this into headache types, and they're also detailed in your packet um, in the table. So starting on page 213 in the, in the packet, if you want to follow along, is the evidence for chronic migraine therapy prevention. And this is for patients that have uh, 15 or more migraines per month. 
that there was a demonstration that there was not quality of evidence for all four of the preventative mi migraine treatments uh, and reduction of migraine days per month, anywhere from 1.8 to 3.5 days a month compared to placebo, as well as an improvement in quality of life. For episodic migraine prevention, so those with zero to 14 migraines per month, and that data is outlined in page 219 um, in a table there, starting on page 219. Um, and for episodic migraines, the number of migraine days per month were reduced with, again, all four preventative therapies compared to placebo with a difference ranging of approximately one day to almost three days. And uh, again, quality of life was also improved. Turning to the next slide for acute migraine treatment, starting on page 227 of your packet, for the outcome of freedom of pain at two hours, both of the newer agents, uh, REM Japan and Ubro Japan, were effective, more effective than placebo by a difference of about 6.4 to 16% um, reduction in patients experiencing, or improvement in patients experiencing pain freedom based on mild, moderate quality of evidence. And then in the active treatment trial comparison between Ryan Japan and Simutriptan, they found similar uh, efficacy rates with the, that study in the sense that at freedom from pain at two hours was 31.4% with Ryan Japan and 35% for Simutriptan. For clinic, uh, cluster headache prevention, <clears throat> Galkinexumab was more effective than uh, placebo for the prevention of cluster headaches at week three with a reduction of 3.5 headache, fewer attacks per week. Um, however, by week eight, there was no difference between uh, the two groups. So moving on to safety and evidence. There was only low quality evidence available for safety because again, um, these trials were short duration and some of them were single treatment trials. But um, the evidence that we do have um, states that adverse events, severe adverse events and discontinuations were similar to placebo for the majority of the CGRP inhibitors. As mentioned, some of the limitations are that it's uh, conducted in a small number of patients with um, only one to two month period um, of trial duration, and again, this is a chronic condition, so uh, safety long-term is unknown. Some of the trials only evaluate treatment of a single migraine attack within the treatment window, and there is insufficient evidence for the use of these CGRP inhibitors in different subgroups as well as evidence beyond 24 weeks. Uh, JERP also downgraded the evidence due to manufacturer sponsor, sponsor, sponsorship and extensive involvement in trials, in the actual trial themselves and data analysis. And there was also bias in the results due to imprecision because of infrequent events, uh, occurrences during the, uh, the trial durations. So the recommendation for the class is after clinical review, there were no changes to the PDL, and to update the PA criteria to include the two new acute migraine treatments as well as the new indication for galcanazumab, and to evaluate costs in um, executive sessions. So if we look at the PA criteria, you can see on the slide there that Table 1 has been added to um, provide FDA-approved indications for the different CGRP antagonists. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that this is referenced in number two of the criteria that, that um, it is for an FDA-approved indication outlined in that table. Number three is standard wording. Um, number four just directs uh, providers to the renewal criteria if needed. At number five is asked um, if the medication is being prescribed in consultation with a neurologist or headache specialist, and this is carried over from the previous criteria for the just um, that was approved last time for the preventative therapies, as well as if um, the headache is in, is due to medication overuse. And then if it's not, we ask providers to go to number seven. And this is where it's delineated if the request is for acute treatment in adults or um, cluster or preventative. So um, you can see there, it's for acute, they go to 12. If it's for cluster headache prevention, they go to number 15. Number nine, um, I just added that the patient is an adult because these are just approved for uh, adult use. And then number 10 and 11 are... Um, criteria that has not changed since the last review of this class. So if we go down to number 12, this is where we talk about the acute migraine treatment. And here we ask if the patient has 
reconciled an adequate trial of three or more different tryptans or have contraindications to them. And if they have tried that, there is a verbal change here in number 13 delineating if the patient has chronic migraines or if they're just using the drug for acute migraine treatment. If they have acute migraines, then um, go ahead and it's approved for three months. If it's for chronic use, the directed to number 14, in which we ask if the patient has a history of at least four migraines a month and is on preventative migraine therapy. And if so, that it can be approved for three months. So number 15 refers to the treatment of cluster headache and asks if the patient has had at least four headache attacks per week and also has a history of cluster headaches beyond one month. And if so, if they've tried and failed um, at least two cluster headache preventative treatments outlined there in number 16. And then if we look at the next slide, there's renewal criteria. And it, this, I can go through it number nine, number, by number if you'd like, but what it really is asking just for the different um, acute preventative and cluster headache, just that the patient has had a documented response by either a reduction in migraine headache frequency or intensity for each of the different um, indications. And um, number seven actually should be eight cluster headaches per month rather than week. So I do need to update that. Are there any questions? Second to navigate the mute button. Any questions for Kathy? We still have an opportunity. We have, in addition to the written comments that were posted on our website and shared with the committee in advance, we have a fair bit of verbal comment. Um, so the first person we have is Jennifer Shear from uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals. Give me one second to find you and get you.
in regards to long-term safety, across 24 clinical studies in the HLV Clinical Development Program, 4,077 patients with migraine have been exposed to HLV. No additional safety signals were seen across exposed populations. Pool data from three phase three clinical trials indicate the treatment with HLV over 12 weeks has a cardiovascular safety profile similar to placebo. In 1.08 percent of phase three clinical trial participants reported constipation based on the available safety and efficacy data and HLV's option for monthly and quarterly dosing I respectfully request the committee to consider placing HLV on the preferred formulary status. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you Jennifer. Any questions for Jennifer? Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Next, you bet. We have Chelsea LaRue with Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. Chelsea, you're unmuted. You want to give your line a test? Yep. Are you able to hear me okay? Loud and clear. All right. The floor All right, is yours. Great. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Chelsea LaRue, and I'm from the Medical Affairs Department at Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. And I appreciate the opportunity to present supportive information regarding NERTEC ODT, indicated for the acute treatment of migraine with or without aura in adults. NERTEC ODT is available in a 75 milligram orally disintegrating tablet formulation that dissolves rapidly within seconds without the need for water and is the only oral CGRP antagonist with a long half-life of approximately 11 hours. NERTEC represents a novel mechanism of action that directly targets the underlying pathophysiology of migraine treats migraine without the vasoconstrictive effects of tryptans and is not associated with addiction potential or medication overuse headache. An acute migraine treatment is suboptimal if the patient experiences persistence or recurrence of their headache after taking their medication, requiring them to take a second dose or additional rescue medication. A single dose of Nurtec ODT provides rapid release that lasts through 48 hours. The profile of Nurtec ODT achieves the four goals of acute migraine treatment put forth by the American Headache Society including number one, rapid and consistent freedom from pain and associated symptoms without recurrence. Nurtec treated patients achieved rapid pain relief within 60 minutes, as well as freedom from pain and freedom from most bothersome symptoms by 90 minutes. And all of these efficacy endpoints were sustained through 48 hours with a single dose. Number two, restored ability to function. After taking Nurtec, patients returned to normal function by 60 minutes. In a 52-week long-term study, NERTEC significantly reduced migraine-related disability and lost productivity time. Number three, minimal need for repeat dosing or rescue medications. Only 14% of patients treated with NERTEC ODT used rescue medication within 24 hours. 63% of NERTEC treated patients who were pain-free at two hours remained pain-free through 48 hours without redose or additional rescue medication. Lastly, number four, minimal or no adverse events. The most common adverse reaction was nausea, which occurred in 2% of NERTEC ODT-treated patients compared to 0.4% on placebo. In the one-year long-term safety study, only 2.7% of patients discontinued due to an adverse event. No serious adverse events were related to NERTEC, and no clinically relevant laboratory abnormalities were observed. In summary, one 75 milligram orally disintegrating tablet of NERTEC provides migraine patients with both rapid and sustained relief without redose or titration. Biohaven respectfully asks the committee to consider adding Nurtec ODT as a preferred agent with a trial and failure of up to two tryptans or contraindication to tryptans, as this is in accordance with guidance from both the American Headache Society and the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, or ICER, for new oral acute migraine therapies. Thank you for your time and attention. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chelsea. Any questions for Chelsea? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Carrie Johnson, again, with Amgen. And Carrie, okay. I think I unmuted you if you want to check your... Great. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Thank you. All Great. The Thanks so much. All right, it's uh, Carrie Johnson again, pharmacist with Amgen Medical Affairs. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the committee with an update and testify in support of Amovig. Amovig is a fully human monoclonal antibody to the CGRP receptor, is indicated for the preventive treatment of migraine in adults. It can be self-administered using the SureClick auto-injector, and it comes in two dosing options. Of the injectable CGRP product, Amovig is the only one that specifically targets the CGRP receptor. 
It has an established safety and tolerability profile as well. The most common adverse reactions in clinical studies were injection site reactions and constipation. Recent label updates to Amazig warnings and precautions include serious complications with constipation, updated in October of 2019, and new onset or worsening of pre-existing hypertension, updated April of 2020. Both updates were a result of post-marketing surveillance. Please see the full Amovig prescribing information for further information. The recently fully published American Headache Society consensus statement on integrating new migraine treatments into clinical practice provides the following recommendations. A monoclonal antibody to CGRP or to the CGRP receptor may be prescribed after a six-week trial of two classes of drugs. Second recommendation is treatment can be initiated by any licensed medical professional. Prescribing is not limited to a neurologist or headache specialist for this guidance. And number three, patients who have had medication overuse despite the use of preventive treatment may require an escalation in dose, a change in preventive therapy, or the addition of another preventive treatment. Excluding patients with medication overuse headache from receiving a preventive treatment now is counter to this recommendation. Some updates specific to Amavig relate to long-term data. So the first update, long-term data is available from the registrational STRIVE study in patients with episodic migraine. At the four-and-a-half-year interim analysis of this ongoing five-year study, three-quarters of patients receiving Amavig achieved a 50% reduction in monthly migraine days along with a reduction in pain intensity. Amavig were generally well tolerated, no increase in adverse events over time was seen, and no new safety signals observed. Additionally, the second Long-term data is developed from the registrational phase two chronic migraine study. At one year, two-thirds of chronic migraine patients converted to episodic migraine. Injection site reactions and constipation were the most commonly reported eight adverse events, and no new safety signals were observed. Migraine pathophysiology is multifactorial and complex, and migraine is a very heterogeneous disorder. No two patient migraine experiences or response to treatment are the same. Imavig has demonstrated long-term safety and efficacy, showing sustained reductions in monthly migraine days, Amovig also has a unique mechanism of action and comes in two different dosing options that can be self-administered. We respectfully request that the committee add Amovig to the preferred drug list. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to address any questions. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Any Thank questions you. for Carrie? Okay. And then we also have Dr. Quo. Uh, I don't know if I got your name right. I'm trying to unmute your line. Thank you. Hopefully I'm unmuted. Um, there we go. Here you loud and clear. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm Alex. Okay, just for the committee, uh, generally, uh, we have representatives of the industry. Uh, important to know the conflicts of interest. You are in private practice here in Oregon. Um, your conflict of interest to the committee, just so you know, you represent yourself and patients, uh, but you do do some public speaking on behalf of the company. So if you can uh, kind of state for the company or state for the committee uh, your practice and also disclose verbally any of your conflicts. Sure. Um, Alex Krobe, I'm one of two board-certified headache medicine providers in Oregon. Um, I'm, I'm employed by Providence, but I'm not speaking on their behalf. Um, as one of two board-certified headache medicine providers, I have been, I have had relationships with just about every player in the field. Um, so just assume the answer is yes if I have commercial, you know, relationships with uh, the manufacturers of the drugs that we're talking about. I think that would be fair to say. Appreciate Yeah. Um, that being said, I'm speaking on behalf of like the hundreds of thousands of people in Oregon with migraine. Um, I treat a lot of OHP patients, and I have four basic comments. First of all, there is a class difference between the long half-life injectable monoclonal CGRP inhibitors and the short life, uh, short half-life GPANs. It's important that your final algorithm not confound these two distinct classes of treatment. It's also important that the final document not arbitrarily restrict rational polypharmacy in the form of combined use of onobotulinum toxin with either monoclonal CGRP inhibitors or GPANs. We recognize the importance of combination of long-lasting and short-lasting medications in disease states, including asthma and diabetes, and the same is true in migraine. The final document should not arbitrarily limit access to one if the patient is taking the other. The second point is triptans have helped lots of people with migraines, but efficacy is only one clinical consideration. Safety and tolerability are equally important, and while efficacy, as measured by migraine pain relief and migraine pain freedom of the GPANs, is empirically 
comparable to triptans, the contraindication and side effect profile of the GPANs is manifestly superior to triptans. GPANs are not associated with medication overuse headache. They have few life-threatening drug-drug interactions, and they're not contraindicated in patients with medical comorbidities. The final document should encourage step therapy with a reasonable number of treatments, uh, triptans, and while two or three triptan failures might seem like a reasonable number, evidence shows that when one triptan fails, switching to an alternate triptan does not improve patient outcomes. When triptans fail, switching to an alternate, sorry, uh, the two most common alternatives uh, used by prescribers are opioids and butabatol. Ineffective acute treatment and the use of opioids and butabatol results in medication overuse headache and the chronification of migraines. In the case of triptan failure, almost 10% of people resort to urgent care or emergency department treatment. ED visits are also significantly higher if opioids are used. So the question of two or three triptan failures in the case of hypertension, when propranolol fails to work, do we insist that people also try atenolol and then metoprolol before changing drug classes? Point number three, medication overuse headache is the natural outcome of the use of incompletely effective treatments to manage a disease that left untreated would result in incapacitation. These are people with frequent or chronic migraine who must treat migraine in order to fulfill the roles that people depend on them for. So. Um, we need to uh, have an off-ramp for people with medication overuse headaches, such as medications that are not associated with medication overuse headache. Lastly, I would like to point out that patients do not fail medicines. Medicines fail patients, so please make sure that the final document reflects non-stigmatizing language. Thank you very much on behalf of all the people in Oregon who have migraine, including myself. <laughs> Talking on mute, a lot of information there. Thank you very much. Uh, there might be some to unpack with the committee, so I'll give them a chance to try to find their mute or unmute button and see if they have any questions for you. All right. Well, again, thank you for treating our OHP patients and for taking the time to share your comments with the committee. Uh, Kathy, if I can turn it back over to you to um, recap the recommendations in front of the committee. Sure, thanks, Roger. So the recommendations stand as uh, revising the PA criteria to include the two new therapies, as well um, as outlined in the cr criteria we just discussed, and to um, include the new indication for dalcanazumab uh, for cluster headache prevention. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Great. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone, anyone opposed? Okay, motion passes. Great. We're going to push on here a little bit. Um, we'll be going to page 236 in your packet. And we'll be turning it over to Deanna, but before we stop, we start the topical analgesic. Um, we were talking about renewal criteria, and uh, Deanna pointed out to me um, that the orpilizumab PA criteria that we had in the packet, which is actually on page 183, uh, and it should be on your screen right now, and the question number one, the renewal criteria at the bottom of the screen, that's the criteria that we could propose uh, including. Is that correct, Deanna? That is absolutely correct. So, Kathy, thank you for pointing out that the renewal criteria was not in the packet. Um, I'm not sure how it got chopped off. <laughs> but when I went back and went back, <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like trying to figure that one out. I'm like, did I not have to be printing? <laughs> no, I just think there was a lot to include for the oral MS drugs. So the proposal is to use this criteria just to make sure that um, the, the patient's condition has improved as assessed by the prescribing physician and that the physician attests to the patient's improvement. So if the P&T &T committee agrees, that's a mouthful, um, we'll just use that renewal criteria for the oral MS drugs. So again, let's take the formal motion. That's one of, so Kathy, maybe do you want a formal motion to include this renewal criteria for the oral agent? I make a motion to include this uh, criteria for the um, this cost of medication. For the oral medic oral MS drugs. Oral MS drugs, yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you for that pickup, Kathy.
happy. It's always nice to have another pair of eyes. Great. Right. And with that, we'll leave it with you, Deanna. And we're doing the top look at El Jesus. Again, page 236 if you're following along in the full text. Okay. So, um, next slide, please. So the purpose for this was to um, evaluate any new evidence for the safety and effectiveness of the topical analgesics. The last time the P&T committee reviewed this was January of 2016. Um, and at that time, um, we found uh, moderate quality evidence to support the, the short-term use of topical non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs for treatment of acute uh, muscular skeletal pain. Um, and then in July of 2018, we talked about neuropathic pain. And at that point, we looked at uh, the safety and efficacy of topical capsation and lidocaine. And uh, the strength of evidence for those two drugs uh, was lower in sufficient as most of the data came from single studies and was imprecise. So um, at that point, we put a quantity limit on the topical lidocaine patches to three per day for the manufacturer labeling to ensure safe use. So if you're interested, the PA criteria for the lidocaine patch is in appendix four on page 256. Appendix one on page 252 lists all the topical analgesics that are included on PDL and um, our preferred topical analgesics right now are capsation cream and diclofenic drops. You'll see that our non-preferred uh, drugs um, are all the other forms of diclofenic, capsation patch, lidocaine cream, lidocaine patch. Um, we had about 50 OHP fee-for-service patients that had claims for topical analgesics in the first quarter of 2020. Most of the claims were for capsation, but then, um, interestingly enough, we had a lot more claims for the diclofenic gel, and uh, we had about 40 claims for diclofenic gel, the non-preferred agent, and 20% of claims were for lidocaine. We have never reviewed the topical anesthetic, which includes uh, lidocaine, prilocaine, tetracaine, and benzocaine in combinations. So um, when you look at the list of um, the preferred drugs, you'll see that quite a few of the drugs in that list currently do not have a PDL status. And since there's similar drugs in the topical analgesic and the topical anesthetic classifications, we included both medications class, both medication classes in this update. And a lot of this was really um, initiated by concerns that DXC had when they got claims for lidocaine cream. They weren't really sure how to handle it because it didn't have PDL status and the lidocaine patch. Uh, criteria didn't really apply. So uh, that was the impetus behind this review. Next slide, please. So this table is extracted from table one on page 240. So it's just a summary of uh, the topical analgesics. And you'll see that most of the topical analgesics are approved for acute pain. Um, we have two topical analgesics that are approved for post-repetic neuralgia, which is the capsation 8% patch, which is very rarely used. That's the patch that the provider has to apply, and um, it requires some topical anesthesia before you apply it because it's very painful, um, much like hot peppers are when you get those in your eye or something like that. And then the lidocaine patch um, also has the approval for post neuralgia. Interestingly enough, the other topical lidocaine products, like the creams, the ointments, and the gels, those are uh, approved for acute pain. Next slide, please. So there were five systematic reviews that have uh, been recently published for this class of uh, Four of the reviews focus on efficacy and safety of topical diclofenic, capsation, lidocaine, and salicylate for acute and chronic pain. And then one systematic review looked at the safety of topical non-steroidals 
used for pain associated with osteoarthritis. So uh, this slide summarizes the two uh, systematic reviews about chronic pain. And um, it, the 2016 Cochrane review showed when it looked at topical non-steroidals for chronic pain, uh, when they compared topical diclofenic to placebo, uh, the topical diclofenic was more effective than placebo in 50% pain reduction with a number needed to treat of 10, and that was based on moderate quality evidence. Not surprisingly, um, there were more uh, local adverse events, mostly mild skin reactions that were associated with the topical diclofenic compared to a placebo or oral nostroidals. Now, oral nostroidals are not going to have topical adverse effects, so that's not surprising. Uh, with a number needed to harm of 16 and moderate quality evidence. Then the 2017 Cochrane review looked at the safety and efficacy of high concentration, the 8% topical capsation. And uh, what they did in most of these trials was they used the uh, low dose uh, capsation, the one that you can get over the counter, the 0.04%, as the active comparator. So uh, four uh, randomized control trials that were in post hepatic neuropathy showed that there was improved pain uh, relief with the higher concentration of capsation, uh, moderate quality evidence with a number needed to treat of nine. When they looked at HIV-associated neuropathy, there was two randomized uh, trials for that, and they saw that the capsation 8% um, reduced uh, the pain about 30% over baseline uh, uh, compared to the low dose capsation. And then finally, when they looked at diabetic peripheral neuropathy, there was no differences uh, when they looked at capsation or placebo uh, for pain or lack reduction. Next slide, please. So when they looked at uh, acute and chronic pain, there was a 2017 Cochrane review that basically just pulled all the data from any prior uh, Cochrane reviews, and they were looking at all of the topical analgesics, uh, and they were looking at acute and chronic pain in adults. So for acute pain, they noticed that the diclofenic formulations were superior to placebo when they were used short term, only for a week, um, and that was a moderate uh, quality evidence with numbers needed to treat between four and five. For chronic pain, uh, topical diclofenic again uh, was superior to placebo uh, for duration of less than six weeks uh, with numbers needed to treat ranging between uh, five uh, for less than six weeks and uh, 10 when it was used greater than six weeks. And then finally, when they looked at peripheral uh, post hepatic uh, neuropathy, the, um, they showed that the topical, topical capsation 8% uh, was efficacious compared to uh, placebo. Never needed to treat of one. Um, but again, like I said, that, that drug is very difficult uh, to administer. Uh, on the next slide um, is the final, uh, is the fourth Cochrane review where they looked at uh, topical non steroidals for acute pain, and in this uh, analysis, they pooled data from uh, 10 randomized control trials, and they showed that uh, topical diclofenic was superior to placebo with a number needed to treat of four, um, and they saw similar um, adverse event uh, rates, interestingly enough, with the topical diclofenic compared to uh, patients that received placebo. And then this final slide, next slide, uh, was the systematic review looking at osteoarthritis pain. Uh, once again, they were using topical non and um, they showed there was more um, adverse events with topical diclofenic than placebo. Um, this was just focused on safety, not efficacy. <clears throat> and there was more study withdrawals with the topical diclofenic, <clears throat> and they showed that there was no difference. Uh, in, in odds between diclofenic and those that receive placebo. So that's just a summary of our uh, systematic reviews. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, the American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis Foundation did issue a guideline in 2019 about management of osteoarthritis 
of the hand, hip, and knee. The only strong recommendation they had was for the use of topical non-steroidals for knee osteoarthritis. Uh, the conditional recommendations for patients with hand osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis OA, had to do with the fact that uh, there was practical considerations such as frequent hand washing and the fact that there wasn't a lot of direct evidence for efficacy in the hand. Um, and then also, I didn't include the, this in the recommend, in the conclusions, but um, they had very little evidence for using um, topical agents for hip osteoarthritis because um, basically the uh, topical product would not be absorbed uh, sufficiently to provide any pain relief. Um, if you look on page uh, uh, 147, it's some of the other conditional recommendations um, for uh, capsation, which they recommended conditionally to use that for knee osteoarthritis and against using capsation for hands. And then uh, there wasn't uh, sufficient data to make any recommendations about the use of topical lidocaine in osteoarthritis, which is not surprising. Uh, it is mostly uh, the 5% patch is approved for neuropathy, not for uh, pain. Next slide, please. So switching gears a little bit, the topical anesthetics that we were talking about are the ones that you think about um, that are mostly used uh, in hospitals, usually before uh, pediatric patients get an IV inserted or um, if they're going to have some sort of procedure where they want to anesthetize the area. Um, topical anesthetics, though, they are also approved for use in alleviating pain associated with hemorrhoids, sore throat, uh, dermal irritation. Um, sometimes we'll see benzocaine uh, over the counter used for sunburns or abrasions of the skin. Um, according to the Oregon um, Health Evidence Review Commission prioritized list, most of those conditions are not funded. Uh, minor burns, um, uncomplicated hemorrhoids, and compact dermatitis, all three of those are not funded. So for that reason, I just focused on uh, funded conditions, which would be perioprocedural local anesthesia, anesthesia or um, IV cannulation. So um, these are the three products. I think the, the biggest difference is the Emla cream um, takes a lot longer uh, to have an onset of action compared to the other products, either the LMX or the uh, self-heating lidocaine, tetracaine patch, they all last um, about the same amount of time, though. Next slide, please. So there wasn't a lot of good evidence about the efficacy of these drugs. I found one Cochrane review from 2012 when they looked at using Emla cream uh, prior to ulcer debridement to help alleviate pain, and they basically compared that to placebo, and moderate quality evidence showed that patients that got Emla cream had lower pain, um, and then there wasn't any differences in adverse effects with respect to burning or itching. Then there was another Cochrane review from 2017 that looked at topical anesthetics for pain control during repair of a dermal laceration. And uh, they're basically, this review showed there wasn't that much evidence uh, to look at comparing topical anesthetics versus uh, local anesthesia. And um, they really, the data that they did found, found that there was no difference, but the data had a high risk of bias. Next slide, please. So, um, interestingly enough, you may have seen that uh, Voltaren has gone um, over the counter, uh, diclofenic. Um, so, that happened um, here. And then, uh, Flector topical uh, system is now approved for use in pediatric patients. Prior to this, it was just mostly approved for adults. It didn't say if it was appropriate for use in pediatric patients. Uh, next slide, please. So the safety warnings um, were the topical benzocaine. So anything that might be used for teething, for example, um, those are contraindicated because um, they provide they provide carry serious risks and they provide little benefit uh, for helping with or, uh, oral pain. And the safety risk is uh, the risk of methionine globinemia. So uh, manufacturers are 
urge to stop marketing the over-the-counter products uh, to uh, infants that are teething. And then the topical lidocaine products uh, that are in combination with prilocaine or tetracaine also carry that same risk, and that was added to the prescribing information. So next slide, please. So the recommendations are to rename the topical analgesics as topical pain medications and to add the topical anesthetics to this new PPL class. And then uh, given the fact that we don't have uh, sufficient comparative evidence for safety and efficacy, to designate at least one topical anesthetic uh, that has an indication for a funded condition uh, to be preferred in the list of topical pain medications. Um, uh, based on drug costs in the exec session, and so we'll review costs in executive session. Uh, there are no PA changes at this point in time. So um, I don't think we have public comment, but are there any questions about the summary that I just went through? We do not have any public comment. Good job, Deanna. Um, this is Kathy. When I was looking at Appendix 1, you know, what, what was in the PDL, I didn't see any diclofenac as listed as being on a PDL. You said something about the, the um, drops, but it says no after it. So I was wondering that's why. Question. Yeah, because when I, when I looked at, at it, that's where I found that. Let me open the packet. Um, uh, let me just go to the website. I think that's going to be the easiest thing to do. But it could be a typo. It could be a typo. Um, that, that information is uploaded um, on the PDO status uh, based on what's on the website. Um, so I may have looked at it wrong when I was um, summarizing it. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of use of the diclofenic, um, even though it's not preferred. Oh, you know, I think what it might have been, those drops might have been the eye drops. Um, I thought we had drops as well, um, and I think we moved that to ophthalmic. That might be what happened. Well, let me look on the uh, website. I'm sure. I think to your point, Kathy, they're on the PDL, but they're non-preferred. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. So there are two kinds of drops. drops. Yeah, the drops are One is ophthalmic, one is on the knee. Ophthalmic, because yeah. that's a commonly used. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there, are, there is a topical, but it is not preferred. So I, I misspoke on that. Sorry. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Anna. That's Stacy. But you're recommending, though, that we do add something as preferred, correct? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know. I mean, Especially since the diclofenic has gone over the counter. Exactly. And, you know, we're, you know, we, we really are trying for whatever alternative therapies we can come up with, so I'd say at least one week. Sure. You, you mean instead of opioids? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. Stacey, at that point, for the oral tablets, the yeah. NSAIDs, diclofenac is preferred. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Deanna? All right, with that, can you recap the recommendations in front of the committee, the clinical recommendations, before we go into the deck? Sure. It's just basically to rename the topical analgesics as topical pain medications, and uh, we will uh, evaluate what we want to add to the PDL based on drug costs in the exact session. I had to find my mute button. Uh, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Roger. There we go. Sorry. Um, so we have one more topic on the agenda, but again, because we're going to take about 20 minutes, we're thinking we might need to defer that topic because we have so many classes to go through in the executive session. Um, so if the committee is amenable with that, and Kathy Centena, you don't uh, mind too much? No, no problem, Roger. 
Yeah, a lot of classes. I do apologize. We had one person that signed up uh, from Red Hill Biopharma. Wendy, we won't be getting to that class. We will have to defer it to a, the, probably the next meeting. Uh, so apologies. Um, but, yeah, we have so much to go through in executive session. We don't want the committee to be going too much past five if we can help it. So um, with that, we are going to mute the line for this Zoom PowerPoint. Uh, for the PNC committee, I have sent you an email with a conference line and information that we'll go through uh, confidentially. And then we'll join back in to this meeting. We'll put up a slide when we're reconvening for recommendations. Um, I have to read a blurb before we go that direction. But again, no action will be taken in executive session. We will come back to open session before we take any formal action. So the p and committee will now meet in executive session for the purpose of consideration of information or records that are exempt from disclosure by law. Executive session will be held pursuant to RS-192-6602F and RS 414355 which allow the PNC committee to meet in executive session to review confidential pricing information, including substantial cost differences between drugs within the same therapeutic class that is necessary for the committee to make final recommendations or to comply with the requirements of House Bill 2100. Representatives of news media and designated staff should be allowed to attend the executive session. All their members of the audience, well, I ask to stand by until we come back to Zoom. Um, and again, uh, Representative News Media are specifically directed not to report on any deliberations during the executive session except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. At the end of the executive session, we'll return to open session, put up a slide on the Zoom, and welcome the audience back in the room and unmute the line. Thank you. From executive session, so just letting uh, those still participating on the Zoom call know that uh, we're waiting for members to come back in, unmute themselves so I have a head count and we make sure that we have a quorum before we take uh, recommendations in open session. So thank you for your patience. All right. Uh, again, thanks everybody for your patience while we went through classes in executive session. Uh, I'm going to lump some classes. There was some debate about uh, other recommendations, so I'm going to take those separately so the committee can hear their votes and have dialogue. So after review an executive session for the antipsychotic class update, the recommendation is to make aripiprazole tablets and zeprazitone capsules preferred. For the serotonin agonist class update, the recommendation is to make tosimra nasal spray non-preferred. And for the VEGF class update, the recommendation is to make no changes to the PDL. Let's take those first three. We need a motion to approve. Come on. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any uh, aye for me? Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Great. For the ADHD literature scan, after review and executive session, the recommendation was to make list dex amphetamine chewable tablets preferred. Motion. Does anybody want to make a motion to make those tablets preferred? All motion. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Oh. Did we catch those? Nope. So that's why. Still on. Yeah. And as anticipated. Um, so. Minority opinion. I'd, I'd like to hear from the two that opposed. Um, Was there just two that opposed? Yes. Jim, what did you want to hear? <laughs> the no. rationale for opposition? If you'd like to, I'm giving you the opportunity. Yeah, well, you know, so uh, lift amphetamine is available as capsules that have a uh, that have a powder in them that is uh, very easily soluble in water, um, is odorless and tasteless. Um, so uh, a chewable formulation does not add any additional um, benefit or value uh, and um, might be used, you know, the position is being listed as preferred on the uh, PDL might be used as a marketing approach um, for a product that really has a you know, formulation that really has no um, particular use. Um, kids with ADHD are generally um, older, old enough to be able to swallow capsules, and if they're not, if there's a developmental issue or something that prevents um, swallowing a capsule, um, the medicine is very easily put into solution. And Bill, any comments from you or just a no? Okay. Uh, are there any other no's? Hearing none, uh, then I take the vote as 
pass will make it uh, preferred. Uh, the vote was seven in favor, two opposed. All right, for the, see nothing there, there, there. Uh, for the newer diabetes drug, for the DERP summary, uh, the recommendations for the DPT-4 inhibitors are to make Ongliza preferred, Ongliza, GLP-1 receptor antagonist to make Trulicity preferred, and for the SGLT-2 inhibitors to make Farzizia, Jardiens, and Invocana preferred. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Okay, motion passed. No approved. Okay, no opposed. Um, for the CGRP inhibitors, the recommendation is to make Emgality preferred but subject to the clinical PA. For the DERP summary, um, there were no changes recommended to the PDL. Let's take those two. Recommend. All motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And for the final two, the non-statin drugs for cholesterol, the recommendation is to make generic omega-3 fatty acids preferred and remove it from the clinical PA criteria, to make triglide, tricor, antera, and trilipics um, and their generics preferred. And then for the topical analgesics and anesthetics, uh, the recommendation is to add the class to the PDL, to make lidocaine, prilocaine cream, and diclofenac gel preferred. To make viscous lidocaine, lidocaine cream solution jelly with applicator preferred, and to make everything else in the class non preferred. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Fantastic. Well, we run a little bit over, but that concludes our meeting for the day. Um, I will open up in just one second the line for the public to see if there's any additional public comment. Um, but so uh, I just wanted to remind the committee that the next PMT meeting is scheduled to be held on October 1st. Uh, stay tuned. We'll send you out draft materials, final materials, invite the audience, particularly during the draft posting, to provide comments so our staff, my staff, can review that and consider it for inclusion in the final documents. Thanks again to the staff for a well-prepared meeting. We appreciate the work. Yes. Fantastic. Again, I think we handled all but the one class we had to defer for the public comment that was signed up in advance. So thank you all, and that concludes the meeting for the day. Thank Have you. Have a good evening. Thank you.